thing to do. Yep. Well, it sounds like you're prepared for a generalist sort of position. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's 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 been in, it's been a learning curve.
very hot seven day period, we had seven suicides. So a little bit more indication for you of the kinds of people who are most at risk during these events. And I'm, I'm telling you about this, we don't have a study like this for the rest of British Columbia, but we do, when we see hot weather events in the rest of British Columbia, we see these sort of indicators. I'll talk to you about that a bit more in a second. Next slide. So based on the 2009 event, uh, we developed a hot weather warning system that became operational in 2012 and remained operational through 2017. And uh, that's all you need to know about that, but that purple area in this slide was covered by that system. The other thing this slide shows you is other hot weather warning systems in place across the country. And hopefully you can see that the rest of British Columbia is a big gap. So we've kind of been lagging behind other regions in, in establishing this uh, for the entire province. And this is where uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada really comes in, and, and Health Canada as well, is trying to bring the province or the rest of the province up to speed with the rest of the country. And that's why we're making this big push at this time. So next slide, please. We have done a little bit of research around mortality and temperature province-wide. And I just want to show this to you. So these are across the bottom here. We have maximum daily apparent temperatures. And here we have increased risk of mortality. The coastal region, you can see there's a pretty uh, strong relationship between them. And the at 30 degrees, oh, what is the red line? Increase in mortality at 30 degrees. So the red line shows you that there's about an 18% increase in mortality in the coastal region when we hit temperatures of 30 degrees. <laughs> On the dry plateau, where we are currently located, the same sort of analysis, you can see a much smaller increase in risk at 30 degrees. And indeed, even if we go out to 40 degrees, we still don't see that 18% increase. And we know that. It gets hot here. The population is more accustomed to dealing with hot weather than the population on the coast. And there's also more protections in place. Air conditioning is far more common in the dry plateau than it would be in the coastal region. We see a similar sort of smaller response in the mountain regions, but then in the north we see a response that's quite similar to the area on the coast. And again, that's not surprising. These are not populations who deal with hot weather day in and day out over the summer. It's an unusual occurrence when it happens. Okay, next slide. So this is what I was referring to earlier. Uh, in the summer of 2014, we were just doing our sort of routine surveillance for hot weather across the province. And in the Thompson Caribou region, there was this fairly hot period, temperatures getting up to 40 degrees. That's not unheard of, but it's still pretty hot even for the interior. And on this one day, we see pretty much a tripling in what we would expect of mortality. So there's 14 deaths on this one day. It hasn't even gotten as hot as it's going to get, but that's a pretty big spike as far as we're concerned. And it's not caused by car accidents. It's not caused by, you know, a big event that happened. It's just a lot of deaths on that particular day. Next slide. But we didn't go into too much detail here, but I can tell you seven of the 14 deaths were in people under 65 years of age. Four of them were due to things like suicide, illicit drugs, and, and pharmaceutical drugs. Five of them happened at home or in the community. So we see those kind of hallmark indicators of hot weather mortality, the same that we see in the lower mainland, but in this much smaller region when, when you have this event. Were at a 
premise that it be data driven. The WHO recommends that you simply call hot weather warning when you're over the 95th percentile of summertime temperatures. We weren't sure that that was actually going to indicate risk in the province, and we wanted to make sure that whatever values we chose were going to be indicative of actual risk in the different regions. To do this, we looked at the relationship between temperature forecast and mortality over quite a long period, almost eight years, in the four different regions that we were trying to establish thresholds for. Those four different regions are the southwest, which includes the south coast and most of the island, the northwest, which includes the north coast and the tip of the island, the northeast, which is the northern interior, and the southeast, which is the southern interior. So basically, we've kind of drawn, drawn a quadrant across the province into four different areas. And we're looking at the temperatures forecast on day T minus one. So if that's today, we are looking at the temperatures forecasted for tomorrow and for the day after that. And we're trying to associate those forecasted temperatures with the mortality that actually happens on those days. And we're looking at forecasts rather than observed temperatures because that's what we're going to be looking at in the future. We're never going to know the observed temperatures until after the, the uh, event has passed. We're always looking at a three-day sum of mortality. That's partially because some of these regions have small populations. It just gives us a little bit of extra boost in the, or, uh, boost in the signal. And we conduct the analyses for both all deaths and deaths in that particularly sensitive 65 to 75 age category. Next slide. So these are the conditions that we looked at in the original analyses. We're looking for two days with a high over a certain threshold and a low over a certain threshold between them. If those conditions were met, we call that category zero. If one of those temperatures was off by one degree, we called that category one. And if those temperatures were off by two degrees, we called that category two. And we did that because we know that forecasts are not the most reliable things, and we wanted to have a bit of flexibility and a sense that the threshold could be flexible when uh, the forecasters are looking at them in advance and thinking, oh, we're really close to the threshold values, values, maybe we should call them. Next slide. So the things that we're looking for in these threshold combinations is a marked increase in all deaths, an even bigger increase in the 65 to 75 age category, because we know that category is more sensitive, a significant increase in all three categories. And we don't want a ton of these warnings every summer because the public will get fatigued by them. So whatever threshold sets we choose, we're looking for you know maybe two, three, four warnings per summer at most. We don't want 10, 12, 14. That's not going to be useful from a public health perspective. Next slide. So the threshold sets that we chose, and I'm not going to delve too deeply into this, this is for the southwest, which again covers the lower mainland and Sunshine Coast and the, the southern part of the island. We're 29 degrees to the high and 19, no, 16 degrees for the low, sorry. And so here you can see when all of the forecasts were over those thresholds, we see about a 5% increase in risk. When we're one degree off, we see about a 5% increase in risk. When we're two degrees off, we start coming up to about a 15% increase in risk, which simply for me confirms that this idea of examining close to threshold values was important. Next slide. The values for the southeast, you can see here, we've got pretty strong relationships. Um, when we're all the values are over the threshold, we're seeing about a 7% increase in risk, and we see 
about a 7% increase in risk in all categories. I haven't put in all of the various slides we have about this. These thresholds are 35 and 18. Um, but in both cases, for the southeast and the southwest, we see almost a doubling in risk when we look at the 65 to 75 age category, which is consistent with the results that we've, we've had from other studies. Next slide, please. Things get a little bit more difficult in the Northeast. There's not so many daily deaths. The temperature is you know, quite a large region, so there's a lot more variability in the temperatures. And this is where we sort of had to start falling back on those 95th percentile values. So what we've chosen for the Northeast is 29 and 14. And next slide, please. It gets even more complicated in the Northwest. We don't see a really clear signal at any particular threshold value. So here we chose 13 and 28, correct? Correct. But I'm going to show you some more evidence that I think we've done a good job, even though these analyses didn't give us clear indicators of what we should choose in the two northern regions. I'm going to show you some information that hopefully will convince you we've made good choices. So next slide. Please. This is the summary. You can see now. Instead of just having this little area here, we have filled in the whole province. Uh, so there's four different sets of thresholds for four different warning regions. Uh, nice consistency across uh, the interior part of the country there. And then the thresholds for this region are actually higher than the thresholds for this region, and that's really the effect of the mountains in between them. Next. Okay. So here, this is, I can't even tell, it's the southwest um, without the lower mainland in it, because we talked to those guys yesterday. What these colored boxes on the left are showing you is the observed temperatures and whether or not the observed temperatures were over the threshold values. So it's red if all were over the threshold values, orange if there were, we were one degree off, yellow if we were two degrees off. So again, that sort of flexibility around the threshold. What the right is showing us is the mortality in the region during that period, whether or not it was elevated. So during this 2015 event, which again, like the 2009 event, was sort of province-wide, we see warnings at pretty much all of the stations in the southwest region. And we see a bit of elevated mortality, about a 10 to 15 percent increase in mortality in the region in the early part of this event. If we look at the 2009 event, which is the next slide, we can see the signal even more clearly. So we've got all of the different stations are meeting or exceeding the threshold, and we've got that strong mortality indicator for the region. Again, the lower mainland is not in here anymore. So this is mortality in the region outside of the lower mainland. Next slide. This is the same for the southeast. So this 2015 event, we can see some early mortality that drops off after that. But again, most of the stations are approaching or over the threshold values. The 2009 event for the southeast, which is the next slide, please. Lots of hot weather, we don't actually see that mortality. And again, I want to come back to this. We just don't have such a strong relationship between temperature and mortality in this hot region of the province. That doesn't mean that we don't reach dangerously hot temperatures. We do. But it does mean we believe that the population is simply more adapted to living in those temperatures when they happen. Next slide. This is, I believe, the Northeast. It's hard to see. Um, the 2015 event in the Northeast, some of the stations are, are indicating hot weather uh, effects. We definitely see a hot weather signal in the mortality. The next slide is the 2009 event in the north. Oh, wow, no, no, no. Ah, 
This is the 2009 event in the Northeast. A bit of a stronger signal here in both the uh, or in across all of the stations. Again, we see the increased mortality, and then the very tricky Northwest, which is the next slide, please. This is the 2015 event in the Northwest. It's very clearly showing up in Paris, not at the other stations. We do see a bit of increased mortality. There's a very, you know, the Northwest and the Northeast are both very low population regions. So it, it can be hard to make conclusions. And then the next slide, this is the 2009 event in that area. So again, we see actually hotter temperatures in Bella Bella and East Lake. And again, that elevation of mortality. So I think that is it for me. One more slide. And I'm happy to take any questions about this. I'm sorry we don't have really rigorous research on uh, hot weather mortality for the rest of the province the way we do in the lower mainland, but I hope this has been enough to convince you that it is something we should be concerned about and that having these thresholds in place and this system in place is going to be beneficial in the future. Yeah. It's the um, population of the Northwest, and, and the reason I ask that is the analyses that my colleagues are doing in our office for for Prince Edward Island and Labrador are too, the populations essentially are too small um, uh, to, to, to do the analysis. Um, and I'm wondering what the population of the Northwest in is and if that affected the analysis for for that region. So the North East is maybe 150,000? No, maybe more than that. I think they're both a lot higher, but to be honest, okay, okay. the no. Labrador would be... Uh, no, they, they won't be. Um, sorry, I'm just doing... So the Southwest region is about 3 million. The Southeast region is going to be about 800,000. Yeah. And so the rest is in the north, and I'm just trying to parse out who's northwest and who's northeast. But it's hundreds of thousands. Where in in the northwest we have on average one death per day. And is that a big enough population to to do the analysis? Well, and you know, as as you saw, we couldn't come up with clear thresholds from our original analysis. But the thresholds that we came up with, when we look at them with the data we have. We do see the signal we expect to see. So, is it enough to do a really rigorous statistical analysis? No, probably not. Is it enough to get useful information? Yes, I would argue that it is. You, you just have to be, in these small populations, you just have to be practical sometimes, right? Like, Greg? Yeah, okay. thank you. In relation to the interior, uh, I think you call it the dry plateau. Yes. People being more adapted to heat. What about the the aspect that it's so much drier? There's way less humidity here, and people actually cool better, rather than like, for instance, a hot, sticky day in Toronto where you're you get in a car and you're glued to the seats, kind of a thing. Yeah, the type of heat probably has a little bit to do with it, but it does get humid here. Mm -hmm. Um, it does sometimes. Melissa <laughs> and I have been back and forth about this quite a lot. Yes. Um, and and the absolute temperatures are high. So, you know, if I really think it is, there's a lot of air conditioning. Like most people have air conditioning in their homes, so those office environments are air conditioned. And air conditioning is the number one protective factor in hot weather. And if Sarah doesn't mind, I'll weigh in on the fact that the minimum temperature criteria is very important on that aspect. Is the minimum temperature is a very good predictor of humidity. So if that minimum temperature is staying high overnight, 18, it means that it is more humid than usual. So we're not talking about the days where you're reaching 35 or 40 and it's cooling off at night down to 10. We're talking about the days where it's not cooling off at night, and that's a very good indication. It's not even just an indication. That is can be used as a predictor of how much humidity, all in the same way that you'd calculate something like humidex. Thank you. The suggestion to stay within a couple warnings and trying to stay away from giving too many high heat warnings, is that based on just 
what you've seen in other regions where they have given too many warnings or your own experience, or is that just sort of a general based on public health message? Uh, I would say it's both. So as far as I'm concerned, historically, over the past 10 years, we've had two major events. One was in 2009 and one was in 2015. And those are the events we really want to pick up and be able to tell the public about. Then there's a bunch of smaller events in there where, where some messaging is probably going to be useful, a useful reminder to people. Um, so from a public health perspective, I think you know any more than one or two warnings for summer is probably not necessary because it just doesn't get that hot that often. On the same time, I think in the East, and Tom will be able to speak to this, they did experience quite a lot of warning fatigue with their systems in Toronto and Montreal, which were sort of synoptically based, and, you know, they were getting warnings like every other week kind of thing, and people just stopped paying attention. That's, yeah. When you say stop paying attention, like they're just not, they're not implementing the behavior change that you were hoping that they would do with, with a warning? don't believe the forecast. They, they don't believe anymore. the forecast. It's, yes. You know, the it's the boy who cried wolf, right? Okay. They just the, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, well the sky hasn't fallen yet. So we really want to be tell people that it's going to become dangerously hot and then have some experience that holy moly is it hot out. So those warnings match up with the actual experience conditions. The next time we warn them, they think, okay, Last time you guys said this, there was this really hot weather coming. Right. Yeah. Right. Um. Can you ask if the warnings were perfect, uh, warning criteria, warning threshold? Can you estimate how many lives would be saved? Are you implying that our thresholds aren't perfect? Well, if they were, the thresholds that were there, and and your ability to attribute. Mortality above the thresholds. If uh, at the thresholds something were done such that no one died uh, in excess of how many lives did we say province wide? Saved? Well, let's not talk about the the, the south uh, west for which we already have uh, criteria or there were criteria, but in these other areas where they weren't there before, how many additional lives? Might it's a great periods generally associated with a 10 to 20 or more percent increase in mortality for a couple of days in some of these let's say on average across this region more or across the whole non lower mainland region we'd expect maybe 60 deaths per day so on hot days we're having maybe 12 extra deaths province-wide and we multiply that out over maybe three or four days per summer, so 40. Okay, and, and the second question, temperature's changing, but assuming that it stays the same as it is now, mm -hmm. uh, how many days are we talking about per, for the three regions where calls would be made per, on average, per year? Melissa's well, more able to speak to this because she's figured it all out, <laughs> um, but on average, the number of days under warning, I think the most about five. Um, it depends on the location right. greatly. Yeah. In some locations, so let's take Lytton, for example, uh, um, and that is our uh, most extreme. It yeah. can be up to, in some years, I've seen 16, but on average, Sarah's right, about five to 10 at the very most for our hottest locations. I have it included in my presentation, so um, when we're done, maybe I'll circulate it, but I'm not going to get into those details. Be a long conversation. Yeah. yeah, so if we take sort of a, a population approach, the average person might be under warning four to five days per average summer. And, and so I, I, one, one more question, and I'll let everybody else. Um, that we've like always, we've, 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 we've always, <laughs> not on any committee. We, we'd also, uh, we've all, always said that uh, it's not only at the top end that people die because of the heat, that there's a uh, uh, a function that leaks, that links uh, mortality to temperature uh, that begins at the cutoff point that below your call threshold. Well, well below. So, so okay. So take out the deaths that may be associated with the above threshold. 
how many other deaths? I can't estimate reason. that for you because, right. but we know, you know, our thresholds are set, say in the in in the southeast at 35 and 18. We actually know that sort of the the, the function starts to move in this region around 26. So we have that distance between 26 and and 35, where there's a slight increase in risk, but it's not, statistically, you wouldn't see right. more deaths on any given day. On any given day, but pool all of those days. Uh, and uh, it may be that through a combination of environmental based measures, that the death count can be moved down. Yeah. So, so I think that that's also worth thinking about. Yeah. And it, it, it's not really an issue of a HARS. Or of the yeah, it's not extreme call, but hot it is, weather. It's not but extreme it hot weather, but it is hot weather uh, about which we might want to think about doing something. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to cut off this topic. Can you tell you around for a bit? And yes. one question to Melissa. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. I, I was lucky to, to just uh, have the opportunity to two versions of it in the past as well, and with the additional data that yeah. Melissa shared. So I, I am convinced that we are we are at, at, the, at the stage that we can fairly reasonably predict high risk days yeah. uh, with, with a potential heat with health effects and even causing mortality, increased mortality. As you showed, uh, we can now detect or predict within hours maybe or maximum one or two days, two days that we will have increased risk of mortality, not directly due to heat, sometimes due to, uh, due to increased risk, such as increased uh, suicide, increased overdose, and so forth. It is just increased risk. Right. Now, my hope is that to, to learn and maybe you can guide me and uh, or kind of lead me to identify actions that I can take to uh, to uh, to take to minimize that risk. I was wondering if you came across something because it is one thing to know that okay today probably eight more people will die in it. Uh, more people will die in interior due to increased risk of heat uh, because I, I'm not convinced just knowing that or maximum sending a PSA out within three hours that uh, people heat is going to influence or uh, well, influence or prevent those disadvantaged populations uh, that are at highest risk to, to just prevent. So. My, my my question is, how, how you came across other experiences that we as an interior health or other health authorities or First Nations health authorities can take actions take beyond just simply alerting people that heat will be potentially causing increased risk? Um, <coughs> so I would say that clear and consistent messaging that A, hot weather poses a risk, I think a lot of people don't really understand that, and B, there are very simple measures you can take to protect yourself that are, uh, you know, fairly inexpensive, I think that's the first, the first step. Beyond that, you know, there's lots of different ideas and different areas that try different things, and I, I think we'll hear about some of that today. But I honestly believe that if you can, you know, make it clear to a population that extreme hot weather is actually a, 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 can be an emergency, and that they can cool themselves, you know, predominantly by drinking adequate water, wearing a wet t-shirt, keeping the body cool, you're you're a long way there. Because I, I just think that the general public, and there's more than one general public, obviously, but people don't understand that very well. They just don't see 
hot weather as the actual emergency it can be. And the, you know, the public health people and, and, and medical professionals are aware that it can be. So that's the start, is developing that really clear messaging about this can be a risk to you. It might be especially a risk to you under these circumstances. And here's what you should do to try to protect yourself. Tom might want to weigh in more on that, but yeah. Okay. Great. I'm going to hand it over to Melissa. Okay. So, thanks, Zach. Um, I already introduced myself a little bit earlier, but I'm with the Environment and Climate Change Canada during Meteorological Service in Canada, and I work for our Health and Air Quality Services Program. Um, I'm currently the Acting Evaluation Coordinator for the program, so I know evaluation side of things as well. Um, but I work very closely with our um, heat lead, Dave Henderson, um, who's located in Ottawa. He's on the phone, and Dave is um, coming close to retirement. Um, I also have worked quite closely with our um, forecast operations here in Vancouver um, and the warning preparedness meteorology. So for this summer coming, um, your main contact for warning preparedness meteorologists will be, in terms of heat at least, um, will likely be Cindy Yu. And Cindy is um, um, filling in for uh, Matt McDonald that's on front leave, so some of you may be familiar with that. Um, we do have other resources as well. Um, we have Lisa West, who's the Decision Support Desk, so this is somebody that's trying to tie the, um, the work between our service meteorologists that are like the outreaching side to our actual forecast operations. And um, all these people are on the phone right now in case we have any questions for them. So uh, I think that I am a forecast originally, forecaster originally, but working on a national program, more uh, program oriented now. So, okay. you next one for me. So, after yesterday's presentation that I did in Vancouver, I tried to give a little bit more of a background of where we're coming from um, in, uh, within Myers, Canada. So, we tried to do a uh, warning modernization across the country. Originally, our heat warnings were based on a sole 40 humidex criteria across the country, with the exception of BC. And uh, we know that the climatology that varies from um, humidex was developed originally in southern Ontario in the winter area. Um, and we know that that is not reasonable for the entire country as a whole. Um, so, starting in 2004, 2015, Tatum Games, we worked with the public health units in Ontario to try and modernize our heat warning criteria because a lot of problems they were having around how they were going to communicate heat during the Pan Am Games. And this is also part of what our program wants to do. Our program works with health based forecasting issues. Um, and so, we create a partnership with Health Canada, and they're all here today. Um, where they're providing health assistance and health messaging and approach towards their warning. Um, similar to how we worked with Sarah and BCCC for the health evidence here, that's supported by Health Canada as well. And we tried to engage with partners in public health to create more better communication and response around warning. Health Canada will talk about the response side of things. And then as a result, we now have an evidence based heat warning program right across the country this summer. Um, even moving into the territories as well. And uh, exception in a bit, sad. We haven't got there yet, and we're not sure if it'll work. <laughs> and um, we're trying to have a standard national level of service right across the country. Um, we're trying to develop an evaluation framework, at least in terms of how the warnings are disseminated and how they're being used, and along with um, how our service is being taken. And um, trying to create part of that chain reaction so um, we've already talked about the criteria um, through Sarah's presentation. Excellent work, Sarah. Thank you once again of setting it up uh, wonderfully. Um, so I'm not going to really dive into it. We know the criteria here, but I just want to talk a little bit about how those temperature combinations will actually work. So um, we're going to issue a warning based on the forecast temperatures by individual forecast regions. So that's an important aspect. We can see the white lines. Um, these are our actual forecast regions, and those will be 
exactly the region that will light up or a warning would be issued under. So just because it's the same criteria all across the subsidies doesn't mean the whole southeast will have a warning at the same time. It's based just on if that forecast region has forecast related to the criteria in that region. And the way it works, as Sarah said, is that we have to have at least two reaching that maximum temperature in order to call a warning. Something that you're saying is a really important factor in causing more mortality. I don't know if I should have said it's an important factor. <laughs> um, and then we want to see no relief from heat overnight. So between those two days is when you have to see the minimum temperature. So three days, just two minimum temperatures have to be reached and so on. Um, next slide. And with this, we've created a new national level of uh, service that we're going to provide to everybody across the country. And with that comes this new product called the weather notification, which is similar to other weather notifications that um, emergency managers might receive. But this one is directed more so towards our health partners in particular. And we'd like to do this through a single contact for each health authority to then disseminate as they feel it is appropriate uh, following that. And we're going to send that out two to four days in advance of when the heat is expected to begin. I would expect two to three days is our more reasonable estimation, unless we have a really, really strong signal within our computer model. And that same thing over here. <laughs> and then we'll update it if needed. Um, maybe not every day, and maybe you won't see an update. And then we'll move into a heat warning if we think that it's I'm going to give you an example of what a weather notification will look like shortly. Um, I already talked about um, how we would actually issue the warning, and I've already mentioned that it's based on the individual forecast region. There is an exception in the case of the Lower Mainland, um, and we discussed that with them yesterday, and that's the idea that we want to keep the Lower Mainland as a whole. So that includes the Fraser Valley, Lower Fraser, and uh, Vancouver itself. Um, we also have a mechanism called a special weather statement, and we can use that to describe conditions that aren't meeting warning criteria. So think of your really early season events where the public's not going to be acclimatized to the heat, but also mass gathering events um, or possibly combination weather, which I didn't get to mention yesterday, but um, in particular the interior, let's think of a very smoky environment with high heat. Um, we also can issue those at the request of the health authority as well. And then we always like to point out this extended heat warning, which is being used by some of our provincial partners as possibly the action to trigger any heat alert response to the system. That's what HARD stands for. I'm sorry, Greg, we'll talk about that next. <laughs> um, and we did this, we say that that could be a three or more convention days because that's when the traditional heat wave is considered a three days. And also, duration is that really important factor in mortality. So. Maybe duration needs to be when the larger emergency response concerns discussing comes into play. And then I'm not take on here at the bottom the idea of a heat warning demonstration. So we can take an event similar to a bit of the product I'm going to show you in just a minute for possibly 2009, 2015, and then step you through what would have came out, what would have happened each day. And it can even be provided in the form of almost a tabletop where you can discuss the event. And we'll find Criteria now back to that event, and you'll be able to see how things work. Now, I usually do this for each province, but it, it has to be something that's really wanted. It takes about an hour and a half, an hour for the presentation portion, and then a half an hour for discussion questions. So, next slide. So, Sarah mentioned that 2009 event, so I threw it back in here. Um, I compared this. Um, for yesterday in Vancouver, but I wanted to just give a little, little tiny tidbit of information on it. Um, so important aspects we already know about the mortality. Um, that if, at that point in time, we didn't have a heat warning program, so we used special weather statements. Um, is what we issued, and they were issued for at least five days. Um, it was the first time we had all-time temperature records being set on consecutive days. Vancouver Airport reached 34 degrees or more two days in a row. Unbelievable. And it resulted in Environment Climate Change Canada having their actual first health-based heat warning program, which is what was happening in the Lower Mainland. 
little snapshot of some of the temperatures we saw. Um, I don't dive too much into the interior because I was talking about this yesterday for the lower mainland in particular, but there is some really striking temperatures for that area. 38.9 degrees at home. I know they see warm weather, but they're not that extreme. And Port Alberni, 40 degrees. Um, Port Alberni is an interesting one where they actually don't reach warning criteria all that often because their overnight lows drop overnight. And they see that release of heat, so the body gets to cool off. Um, this is just a snapshot of based on what observations I had from that point in time. These are the forecast regions that would have reached warning criteria. It does not mean that other locations did not reach warning criteria. Just what I had and what we quickly looked at between my students and I is that these regions reached warning criteria. For one day. At least for two days, based on the two day requirement for sure. Yes. So I think more about 2015. Um, it was just a bit more extensive and in the interior. Um, so in this example, um, it was a really large, long string of hot weather that started in late June, more on the coastal area, and then moved a, a little bit more interior for that early June or late June period. And then we saw it hit into the north a little bit more, um, come on into the later end of July 7th and 10th type period. Um, there was excess mortality noted. I tried to credit them, Sarah and um, Kathleen, for what work they've done so far here. And we did see some really hot interior locations, such as Lytton, um, reach what would be warning criteria for up to 10 consecutive days. So this is the, one of those exceptions where we are going to see long strings of warnings at some point in time. And this is taking the criteria we're going to use now this year and applying it back to that year. Um, we saw heat warnings in every single region, northeast, northwest, northwest, southeast, um, particular, of course, Paris. Um, and then, I I got that wrong. Port Mellon was supposed to be removed from that. My apologies. Um, I know it's not northeast. <laughs> um, and I already mentioned it was really staggered between two main events, and that was June 26th to 30th, and then July 1st to 5th. It was actually a break around June 30th to July 2nd. Next slide. Oh, look at this. <laughs> yes. So I'm not going to dive into this. It's just something my students threw together. And when Amy circulates the presentation, you can have a little look at what temperatures are reached in each location. It's really too small for people to see. But I have a good snapshot at the bottom. And we see temperatures near 40 for most interior locations. Um, we see 34.6 in Terrace, and that's quite extreme for Terrace, even though Terrace is quite a warm location. Um, <coughs> gives you a good idea of how warm it got. And then once again, applying the same idea, we went back and looked at if this had happened now, these are the warning regions that would have reached warning criteria during that event as well. Um, and so this is really what I want to show you. I know it's a bit small, but this is a sample of what a weather notification would, look, would have looked like for that event. So the heat really was began on um, Friday, June 26th. And so pretend, take yourself back. And on Tuesday, June 23rd, we would have issued a weather notification to that email contact health authority. And it would have started to describe the information that is really important here. And that information in particular. And I think I might have forgot to mention this is not a public piece of information. Right? This is only going directly to our internal email contact um, that we've determined. And the information that we always will see in that is that a good idea of when we expect the heat to begin, beginning Friday is highlighted there, um, that we think that it will last at least throughout the weekend, um, that we have really high confidence in the model. It really, for example, for 2009, said very high confidence, just for a good example. Um, and that by Saturday, we see widespread temperatures in the high 30s to low 40s. And then later on, I say a heat warning is likely to be issued on Thursday afternoon. The conditions that begin Friday. When we issue 
your warning, which is a warning in the afternoon with your afternoon forecast for conditions beginning in the following day. And that gives the public time to adjust anything they plan to do the following day. And then we move into a heat warning with issues. So in this example that you southern interior, um, I've tried to list the warning regions that you saw on that map. Um, it would depend on how you grab the warning, how it would look to you. This is what the actual bulletin would look like. But if you go to our web page and you click on our warning map, you get to click directly on your region and see what that warning looks like. And um, more or less, we describe a little synopsis, synopsis of what we expect the weather conditions to look like. We try to give a good idea of the expected um, place of that event. So in here, it says that um, these temperatures will be significant. Oh, I don't know. I I failed to write a good Actually, I didn't uh, state how long we expected it, but I think they tomorrow and into the weekend at least. Um, one of the important aspects we hope to include in that heat warning by the forecast is when we expect it to end. Um, in this case, it was a really long event. So I don't know if the forecasters would have been able to. I can promise you the forecasters would not have predicted that they would expect listen to see warnings for up to 10 days, but they would have said at least five days or at least three days. Something that would signify it was going to be a like, longer duration. And then if you go to the next slide, Amy. Thank you. So we have a set of messages um, that have been developed with Health Canada to provide about call to action and impact statements towards the That's the cost section. But then when you move farther into this bold area, this is the information that the provinces provided to the lower mainland that we are using our and I suspect there might be a similar, we we're going to keep similar messaging to remind the public that they can check the health link at 811 and to check on government information about where to find cooling locations. Um, we're going to have to change that a bit for other reasons because, of course, we have a statement here about lower mainland health officers, but that's part of our discussion for the rest of this afternoon, um, what you'd like to see included at the end of that morning. Um, for the remainder of the provinces outside of uh, the lower mainland. And then the heat warning ends it. So this is an example of the heat warning ending for some forecast regions um, on June 29th at the end of the day. And then the two forecast regions that really kept that warning going, um, they continue, we continue the heat warning for them. Um, and the heat warning would look almost the exact same as what we just saw. Except it says here that it, the conditions have improved for some areas. And then a second ending um, for those two warmer locations. And I point out that it's Lytton and Lil I'm going to pronounce the wrong, maybe Lilith. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Reach morning criteria until July 10th, which is actually 15 days. There was um, an instance with a one day not reaching warning criteria, and that's something we talked to the forecasters about not turning on and off a warning because we see one day drop to one or two degrees below criteria because that's more confusing for the public than just having a consistent warning asking. And then many other locations within the rest of the province had warnings, especially the lower mainland, the think of the southwest, in that 26th to 28th, 29th period. And then many more locations had multiple different stages of warning between July 2nd and 11th. It's really all over the place. It would be really a great demonstration uh, event. <laughs> and then next slide, please, Amy. And so Sarah's already showed you our national map. Along with uh, BC this summer, we have also implementing new warning criteria for all of Atlantic Canada um, by province. And then we are extend, extending what we're using for our northern warning criteria into the north until we have time to evaluate health evidence. Um, but at this point in time, that's more protective than using a 40 humidex. Um, not to mention, those who don't know, the northwest territories um, actually reach warmer temperatures than most of northern Alberta and northern Saskatchewan. And Quebec's a little bit of a standout here. Um, it states in this map that they use, we use 40 humidex for their warning criteria. However, we issued other statements for Quebec based on the Supreme system, which has been developed by the INSPQ. So they're 
body, much like the BCCC, BCCC in Quebec, and we issue special weather statements based on their warning criteria for the province. And we're working with the province, hopefully, to switch that so that we're issuing our heat warnings along with what they're doing in the province. So I just have a few points that we don't need to dive all into at this point in time, but I've already mentioned that we are looking to distribute the weather notifications via email, and we like to provide one central contact for each health authority, so we need to make sure that we get those. Um, I really highly recommend using EC Alert Me to track heat warnings if you don't already use it for anything else. And you can contact me, and I have a presentation in the deck that I can circulate to you that helps you walk yourself through signing, yourself, signing up for EC Alert Me. And then I've already kind of touched on when we look at heat warnings, we need to think about what we're going to include at the end of the heat warning in terms of provincial based messaging. So, how to um, contact 811, where to go for other further information in terms of heat. And we have that national set of heat health messaging that we use and our forecasters can choose from. And I, we totally encourage everyone to look through that, review it, and recommend what you prefer to be used. Um, in terms of um, in terms of our heat warnings, we have to use the same recommendation right across the board because we can group multiple regions onto one warning. Um, but if there's any messaging that we strongly feel shouldn't be included, we are completely open to that. And um, there's a lot, a few more slides following in an appendix of this presentation that include that health messaging for you to look at, um, but also all the questions that we had about the numbers in terms of by location what we see historically looking back to 2002 to 2017, the numbers that would be reached under warning criteria. Um, and I want to just say that this is based on observed temperatures and not our forecast value. And it's also using a program that's looking for specifically that criteria. So sometimes we might have a warning that was two days, one day didn't reach criteria, and then two more days. It makes it look like more warnings have occurred than actually would have before CASPER was doing it. Um, and that can't be reflected the same in those graphs. So sometimes it might look like there's six warnings, but it's probably three or four in the year. That's extreme, but it's just my example. So, um, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? I know I won't. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, so you were saying that the warnings are given based on individual forecast area, right? Yes. Um, what is that in like, like, how does that relate to let's say our local health areas or like, what, what is, how, how are the boundaries of that? That's an excellent question. If we can go back to the math, yeah. I can give you a better idea anyway. I don't know the exact region though. And if right now our forecast office is working with um, physical health, or I think it is, but I'm not sure exactly who. Cindy might be on the floor and be able to mention this, to try and create a map that overlies those two regions so that we can have a better look at that. Um, I do know that there is some inconsistency through this region and that there may be a little bit of inconsistency through here. I can't remember what forecast region, but those are the only, there's only two regions that are forecast regions themselves that are more divided as compared to the rest of the province. Yeah. Hi, uh, Melissa. This is Cindy on the phone. <laughs> Hello. So yes, uh, we we will create a map with both our forecast regions as well as the health authority regions, uh, kind of the two two uh, uh, region uh, fi kind of files overlapping each other. Um, and it's our goal to kind of include uh, these regions in the um, weather notification to start with. So you get a general idea of you know how. Uh, uh, you know what are some of our forecast values and how is that compared to to your regions of uh, responsibilities? Um, yeah. Thank you, Cindy. And I know we do have an old map where we did this, but there's been a change, and so that's not reflected in the old map that I do have, and I can circulate for information right now. Yeah. Yes. What region is Prince George considered to be in? It's in the northwest. Okay, nice. Or northeast. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, northeast. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You can see it right here. Apparently dead center in the province. Yeah, so here's Prince George right here, and that's in our green. Because IH is not, we don't cover Prince George. IH is Williams Lake and South. Yeah, so and there was a lot of conversation.
conversations when we worked with Sarah on how we would split things up, but in the end, we did this a lot based on climatology in particular, along with what type of temperatures and mortality Sarah was seeing. Um, and there was a lot of talk back and forth about where that line should we be. We moved the boundaries around mm -hmm. quite a bit, yes. mostly because I was trying to keep them as in line with the health authority boundaries as possible, and Melissa was trying to keep them as in line with the climatological boundaries as possible. But in the end, the, the climatological boundaries made more sense, unfortunately, yeah. for... Yeah. All right, I'll be around more but anyway, you can always contact me, contact her in the presentation. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, thank you guys. We're going to take a break until 3.30, but we're pretty much on time, which is exciting. Um, and for those on the phone, if you want to come back at 3.30, if you need to take a break too, that'd be great. But when you come back, please have your phone muted. Looks like that on the map. Yeah, yeah. 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 So he just he called me at two thirty though, so maybe he's on by now. I don't know. How could Dave retire? I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, this on my okay. Because he wrote me at two thirty and said, "Why did the coin this?" But yeah. I know you speculated. <laughs> As we saw from Melissa's presentation, there's some uh, the maximum temperatures that we saw in 2015 for several communities across the province were getting up into the 40s. Um, and with climate change in many parts of the country, we can see an increase in the severity, intensity, and frequency uh, of extreme heat waves. To the next uh, slide. Um, so the heat has health impacts. Um, we can see that in Canada, there's been two major events in the last several, uh, I guess in the last few decades. So the first, which Sarah and Melissa referred to, was the 2009 heat wave, and Tom and others estimated there were 156 excess deaths uh, during the heat wave um, in, in, um, in the southwest uh, British Columbia. In, south in southern Quebec in 2010, there was an estimated 280 deaths. Now, these are uh, related to, to heat. Now, these are 
these are really high numbers. If you think, say, in the Alberta flood of 2013, I think there were around four deaths. Um, so these, like, heat as a natural hazard is one of the biggest killers when it does occur. Um, and so this is one of the reasons in Health, uh, Health Canada why we're working on this file. So to the next slide. Yeah. you mind to turn to directly to that? Sure. And I can turn over here perhaps. Um, in terms of, and can people hear on the line? They can hear it just fluctuating. Yeah. Okay, fluctuates. Um, so, and now Health Canada's heat program. That's better. Excellent. So, Health Canada's heat program. We've been, uh, uh, we we started our heat program in 2008, and uh, the goal of our program is to build heat related, is to build resilience to, to heat, so to lower the number of heat related illnesses and deaths across the country, and to support our partners in, in doing that. Um, Health Canada is interested in speaking with the provinces um, about how we can help them. I'm the lead for British Columbia and for the Atlantic provinces on how to engage. Um, so I was just in Fredericton and Halifax last week speaking with the provinces. And our, our message is, how can we help you to advance a heat response? So we recognize that the province and the local, uh, the, the local communities and regional and municipalities and health authorities um, have the jurisdiction to, in many cases, to intervene. At the national level, um, within our mandate, we have research, information, advice. We do have some resources, um, human and, and financial. And so we're, we're coming to the provinces and saying, how can we help you advance this? So to the next slide. Um, we work very closely with the Meteorological Service of Canada, um, with Melissa, Dave, Tracy, and, and others um, at, at the, the MSC. Um, their goal is to modernize uh, the heat warnings program, as Melissa explained, across the country um, so that it's based on health evidence. We support um, the meteorological service with the health evidence or, or supporting our partners with developing the health evidence for that, um, like the BCCDC. Um, we also um, with uh, working across uh, the country to collaborate with our partners to advance that heat response. And I'll get into a bit more detail on that to the next slide. Um, so what is a heat alert and response system? So to, the, to the next slide. Um, so essentially a, a heat alert and response system has several key components. So one is that an alert is called, and so that's the work that Melissa uh, was describing, that Environment and Climate Change Canada calls a heat warning. Um, the second is that uh, it directs the community response to help vulnerable populations so that there's some kind of plan or action on how to protect vulnerable populations. Um, and, and these um, provide individuals and communities with information on advice on how to protect themselves and how to protect their loved ones. So essentially it's that there's a heat warning, there's some kind of plan, and then that gets activated and there's actions to protect vulnerable people. So to the next slide. Um, how does it work? Uh, this is a really simplified diagram, but here we have Environment, Can uh, Environment Canada and Health Canada um, establish a trigger that's based on the health evidence, in this case the, the health evidence um, that Sarah provided for British Columbia. Um, and it's based on the weather and the health evidence. Um, Environment Canada communicates the potential, because it's a forecast, for a heat warning to health officials. And, and again, Melissa described that. Um, uh, and and those, uh, those warnings are forecast a few days in advance, um, allowing enough time for partners to, to activate or get prepared to, to put in place their heat response. Then health authorities in the third step um, and other key community partners respond to that heat warning. So they put in place actions to reduce um, the number of illnesses and deaths. And I'll get into a very high level description of what some of those actions could look like. Um, what is a heat response plan? And, and there are different types and, and different communities take different approaches. Yesterday we were in Vancouver and they had, I believe, a five or six page document um, that step that had a table with the various actions that get activated when a heat response is called. So maybe the city will, um, city workers will install temporary water fountains or um, workers will check on uh, vulnerable clients in nursing homes. Um, 
there's various actions. Cooling centers will be open, extended hours. So to the next slide. And that's all put into a plan. So I've just highlighted a few different actions here, and there's many, many more. But um, just to give you a bit of a taste of what can be done to respond to heat. So this is in Alberta, and forgive my pronunciation, it's a challenging one for me because I want to say it in French, Le Duc, Alberta. Um, so uh, during the 2016, they hosted the 2016 Summer Games, and while it didn't actually get hotter than 25 degrees Celsius there, they did have a plan in place in, in the event that it did get hot. And so they had um, several, they had water stations located throughout the site, they had golf carts, which sound fun to drive, kind of going around, and they uh, were delivering water uh, to the different events. And they also had volunteers trained in, um, in the symptoms of heat illnesses so that they knew should uh, people show signs of, of heat-related illnesses that then they could take action um, quickly in a, uh, to, to help those people. To the next slide, and there's a photo of a, of a cooling station. Here in, Van or in Vancouver, um, the, uh, the, the city has a response that gets activated when a heat warning is called. And um, just like, I think this is really cool, like you could just plug in a water fountain to the fire hydrant. Apparently the firefighters in some areas are not always super happy, but, <laughs> um, but there's various responses. And this is just three of many responses that, that happen in Vancouver. Um, but you can see at the bottom um, that cooling center signs go up on public spaces like libraries. So these buildings are open anyways, but it's just to let the public know you can sit here and be cool and nobody's going to kick you out. <laughs> this is a place you can come to cool off. Um, so there's increased access to water fountains. They do things like, like on the left here, opening cooling centers, increasing monitoring of outdoor spaces for vulnerable homeless populations, uh, for example, in the downtown east side. To the next slide. Here, here we have just um, four bevy of examples. So the city of Fredericton, just cool ones that I thought were reasonably low cost, but, um, uh, but that uh, cities or, or communities are taking action that they're taking. So in Fredericton, they have um, included heat health information in spring utility bills, um, which I thought was a really low cost and neat way to, to get the messaging to the public. Um, in Montreal, there's um, brochures directed specifically at vulnerable populations. In Hamilton, there's information directed at landlords, um, and, and they've been collaborating with, with landlords specifically. And in Assiniboine uh, Regional Health Authority, which is a rural health uh, authority in, in Manitoba, um, there's been an identification of volunteers who can transport people to cooling centers. So it's a volunteer-based um, uh, uh, program and um, basically it's people helping out their, their friends in the community and uh, partners, uh, people in the community and taking them to where they can be protected. And that's also been done, uh, I believe it's in Durham County in, in Ontario. Um, uh, so other, other places have, have looked at these kind of volunteer um, uh, armies, I guess, of, of uh, transportation. Um, go to the next slide. And we have as we can share, and, and I can point you to that uh, in the guidance part of the presentation. So, how can Health Canada support British Columbia? And so, here we have a bit of a list of the kinds of activities we um, are, you know, we're an office of, or a section, the HEAT program has 10 or so people plus students. So, we can't work with every community across the country. So, our strategy has been to provide information, guidance, advice, working closely with our provincial partners, with the BCCDC, um, and building, uh, supporting them to build capacity um, to, to roll it out across uh, the regions uh, in, in, their, in their provinces and territories. Um, the kinds of things we can, we can help organize, like webinars like this, where there's information sharing from different parts of the country. Um, online training, my colleague Anna Yusa is um, looking to update uh, training for healthcare professionals, how to identify the symptoms of, of heat. We're looking to see if that can be accredited so that it's um, uh, an online accredited course. Um, heat vulnerability assessments, we have expertise in how to conduct uh, stakeholder engagement exercises um, 
to look at, to, to help identify who are the vulnerable populations in your community. And um, many times the answers to how to prepare are in you guys, it's just getting you around the table to discuss. And, and in many cases, uh, you, you, um, the local community will be able to identify those. We can do tabletop exercises, which is scenarios. So if there was a heat wave, and you can run through a scenario of how a community can respond. Guidance documents, I'll get into that. Research findings, so we support, we support our partners with research, like the BCCPC, the work that Sarah was just leading. Um, we also do research in-house, and we, we fund also academics to do research on the topic of heat. Give you two examples. One, Dr. Eric Levine, who's at Health Canada, he's planning to do a study where we um, project, where he projects the um, number of deaths um, into the future under different climate change scenarios. And we will make that information available for every region across the country. So you can then go to your managers and your boards of health and say, here's the projected number of people that would die in this event without further adaptation. We're also, as I mentioned, looking at climate projections. We're, we're, we, we're trying also more um, innovative, looking at ambulance data, uh, telehealth data, things like that. Um, when those become available, some of the more innovative ones, we will make those available. In terms of the last one, my colleague, again, Anna Yusa hosts, um, it's like a, a network. It's essentially like a webinar every few months where uh, there's presentations from people, practical presentations from people across the country who've implemented heat responses, talking about what they've done. Um, and um, this is a network so you can learn from your peers in other places. So the next slide. So this is some of the guidance materials that we've provided. Um, on the left here, I'm, I'm one of the four editors of this, along with my colleague, Dr. Peter Berry. And there's 20 case studies about how communities can adapt, um, have adapted, sorry, to extreme heat or the actions they've implemented across the country. Um, these are really practical three-page case studies. Um, so they're nice and uh, pithy. Um, we have guidance materials for healthcare professionals on how to implement a heat alert and response system. There's brochures more for the general public for information. Um, and my colleague, Tiana, is putting together um, a publication that kind of summarizes, of all these documents, where would you go for your needs in, in a few pages so that there's a bit of a guide for the guide. Um, and that's going to be coming out in the next couple of months. The next slide. Um, so it's just to, to thank you to say that we are here uh, to, to, to support you, um, and we would like to work. Uh, we would welcome the opportunity to work with the, with the provinces and support them. We've been chatting with, with Britt and, uh, and Tom and others about how we, can, how we can move forward. And perhaps with that, I could maybe just pass it over to Sean for just a few words about um, kind of strategically how our, uh, the role our office, Sean sees our office playing. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Gregory. Uh, that was fantastic. I, I think Gregory uh, did a great job of providing an overview of uh, how, how Health Canada is involved in, in the HARS-related uh, work. But uh, maybe just to go into a little bit more detail just about our, our section, and there's uh, a few different components of our section. One is the heat alert response system that uh, Gregory just outlined, and that's really our primary goal, and uh, that, that's our focus, where we really want to help support regions and uh, you know, different parts of Canada on implementing um, uh, the system, so through public health websites and through other ways of reaching the public to warn them about extreme heat events. But also uh, in our group is the health promotion and outreach uh, section, which Gregory uh, talked about. But we're really um, trying to develop that. That's still pretty at, uh, at the beginning phase. So we want to grow that. And if there's anything that people have suggestions for uh, or would like to provide input, we'd be really uh, open to hearing your, your views. Uh, and then also, um, Mike is uh, leading a, an emergency management plan at the federal level. So what do we do when we have an extreme heat wave that would be outside of ours, where we have an event that, like they've seen in Europe or uh, other parts of the world? Uh, and then uh, the last part is, um, is that we are uh, going to be working internationally. And so I'm hoping to partner with the World Health Organization so that we can leverage expertise in other countries and learn 
about uh, how they're handling heat issues in, in other countries. Uh, and um, and that's that's about it. And, and as a, uh, just as a side note, I'm also involved in uh, health research and uh, adjunct professor at Carleton University. So also in, in the research end of, uh, of health issues. So I, I think. Did I leave anything out there? No, I think I think that's I think that's great. Is and Mike, this is Mike, and he's leading our kind of national national sure. program. Mike's right. Do you want to say a couple of things? Oh, you, I'm sure you can. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, Mike is right. I I, I left out uh, another part of our, of our section, but we are working quite hard to build the science evidence base for action. And I think in Canada, um, we still have quite a bit of work to do about understanding how heat affects human health. Uh, Everything from uh, physical health through to mental health, culture, uh, and other things, and so we're we're working quite hard to to build that. So that's something that we could make available to anybody in the room as we're funding research, doing research, and uh, you know, getting our hands on research from other parts of the world. So I think we've got. Thanks, Mike. Good. And thanks a lot, Sean. And I guess if there are any questions about key responses, I think one of the things too that really interested in Hearing from you is what are you, your needs? Like, what are some of the particularities in your region? I think, from what I've heard, I'm chatting on the phone here, it might be cascading impacts. Um, uh, so, where there's heat and smoke, for example, or um, a windstorm knocks out power, and then and then you have a heat wave, um, and, and then then you don't have air conditioning um, uh, unless there's backup power. But, but I guess it's just to throw it out to you all here about what are some of the needs um, from your experiences with heat in, in your communities? Um, how, how have you fared? <laughs> well, I think my mind instantly sort of goes to those vulnerable populations. And I know in the wintertime we have an emergency response system where if we get to a certain temperature, then we have these emergency shelters that open up. And I think about, you know, are we there yet with heat that we're making that connection to our vulnerable population and ensuring that they're protected as well? Part of the issues with, with heat is that it's not so much a nighttime problem where you can provide shelter to people the way that they do. They keep them out in the daytime yeah. in the winter. But they, but uh, so the issue is really quite different uh, in terms of sheltering people. And also, even sheltering in place can be done uh, with the provision of shade and in the daytime and of water, some of which goes on already. So I think we need a different mindset and you know, there's a trigger point where we'll uh, shelter people the way that, that Victoria or Vancouver do in the, in the winter. But right. I, I think we do need to think some of those things through. I, I, I'd say that there, uh, there's a, a couple of things you might want, uh, Britt, to Tell people because I don't know that everybody knows about the uh, guidelines or the, the sort of the promotional material that was done for various uh, health um, groups in BC. Uh, those wheels uh, that were put out, I think, are quite useful. Uh, if you want to mention those, I think that's good. I'm, I'm just not sure which one. The, 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 the stuff that the things that were put together for uh, uh, health practitioners for public health. Uh, for community groups uh, to to let them know about the great aspects of climate change. There was a big emphasis on heat. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. It's I mean, useful promotional material. But you know, yeah. I'll just I'll get back to that in a second. Yeah. But I, I think that okay, for for BC, some of our issues are one about prolonged heat uh, episodes because we don't have enough real data to make any sense of that. But if we can bring what's known from elsewhere together to know what happens when it stays hot for a week. What what do we need to know and what can we do? And how does that differ from what we know and can do for a couple of days of heat? Uh, that's one. And the other one is, what are the, the consequences of, of uh, temperature that goes up and down, which does happen in in, uh, in parts of BC? Because it, it's, uh, it, it's the interstate variability in some places that really seems to be important. So there's, there's various aspects of, of heat that we haven't thought out. We may it may be by pooling information across the country that we can come to more solid recommendations than what can be done in one place alone. Yeah, and I think we've we've been taking a look at that. So particularly in the north, um, where the population is low, we're struggling with how to do a heat health analysis. We haven't gone there yet, but 
can, I mean, there's similar climate around the world. So to our, yeah. to our uh, I mean, you can go to Scandinavia, um, Russia, um, Alaska. Um, so can we work with, in, I think, across the country? Can we learn from our partners? Can we learn internationally? And I think Sean mentioned through the World Health Organization. I think there definitely are opportunities to take lessons learned from others and, and implement them here. Um, here in Canada. Um, other things just too, like what is heat warning fatigue and how can we best define that? I think that would be great to do that at the international level. Um, but um, perhaps if, if you don't mind me picking on you, Dr. Gilmore, Gil Gil um, uh, just some of your experiences um, with, uh, with heat um, and what in, in, this, in this region, um, some of the needs. So, my experience it goes back to 2016 for uh, interior health, and I was really out and about in the media. I had a lot of newspaper, local media, communications, and and kind of our our efforts kind of boiled down to uh, communicating what are the effects, what are the signs, uh, how to identify whether they. Uh, they, they are experiencing a heat exhaustion or the spectrum of the health effects, who are the most vulnerable people, and so forth, just to general information. So uh, our efforts were focused on providing relevant information, giving them uh, some advice of what they can do, and it, it was very, uh, if you search Google still, you have a lot of video clips and and, and radio clips uh, of, of, of that 2015 interior health heat wave. Uh, we, we haven't reached to the point that we uh, ended up or required uh, basically uh, uh, allocating resources or, or deploying any, any resources such as shelter. What, what, what I can say based on my experience, experiencing both uh, wildfires, smoke, and uh, floods, and heat. What I can say, what is unique about heat, and in fact, in fact, silver lining is that you can you can have um, cooling stations uh, that people can come and refresh and kind of get get cooled down and then leave and go back to their places, which is contrary to let's say, uh, clean air shelters, that you cannot say that, okay, come and take a few breaths uh, to <laughs> have, have, have for, for smoke and uh, particulate matter and then go back home. So, so, so that, that's, that's a plus for, for heat. So we, we feel that uh, the, the, if, if I had to do the next step and I'm, I have already exchanged some contact information and I'm happy to, to follow. And Anna, you saw, and I had some conversation as well. So we, we are thinking that identifying the local government capacities are, are key to, to our response. Uh, so identifying public places, the churches, local churches, arenas, hockey arenas, sport activities, the school halls, and, and so forth. And then uh, you'd be surprised. It, I think that my experience is that it's just ice makers, com commercial ice makers are, are critical and would be a great it, uh, kind of uh, uh, thing to do. And a lot of times with, with local contractors, you can, you can rent them, you can kind of arrange uh, to do that. And as soon as you identify the places, you can shelter people. And let's deploy just those like uh, $85 or $150 per day ice maker, you have a response system. So believe it or not, that what we noticed with uh, heat and smoke response, they are reasonable to, and it's like very cost effective interventions that we can do. And I look forward to the opportunity to work for them. Yeah, and I think yes. one of the things that we're, we're offering to the province is perhaps, and I've been saying this to, the, to our Atlantic colleagues, is um, like state, um, support in, in doing stakeholder engagement exercises. So often at the beginning of developing um, a heat alert and response system is to bring many of the partners like, like all of you here today at the table for one community or more communities about how would you best uh, develop a response and, and, and develop a plan. 
um, while we wouldn't be working necessarily with every community, it's maybe something that we could support the province to, to help um, provide support to the province that then perhaps be able to, 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 to provide that to various regions, looking at developing these, say, these uh, workshops to bring people together to have those discussions and develop those plans. Um, I guess I'm coming to the end. Yeah, so I, I'll uh, leave it there. I just want to maybe Britt, um, yeah. Just in follow up to Tom, um, so the Ministry of Health did partner with the Climate Action Secretariat, and we developed a series of five um, fact sheets or backgrounders, if you will, and it sort of looks at climate change through the health lens. And so we've got for, uh, a fact sheet for public health, healthcare providers, communities, and uh, healthcare facilities, looking at what we need to consider and think about within that. Um, if anybody's interested in them, they're great. I don't know if people have already seen them, but uh, yeah, just be in touch if you're interested. It's on the website, yes. If you Google um, Minister of Health and Climate Change, it'll come up. The background is all there. We can send them out to everybody who is on yeah. our list if, with your link. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Kelly, can we hear you? Can you talk? I'm here. Oh, very clear. Thank you. We have two case studies from across the country. Uh, Kelly is from Toronto. Um, Kelly, maybe you want to introduce yourself briefly and I'll drive the slides if you don't mind. Absolutely. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kelly Sebeloskis, and I'm a health policy specialist in the Healthy Public Policy Directorate at Toronto Public Health. And my work focuses primarily on extreme heat, climate change, and air quality issues. So this presentation is sort of a high-level overview of some of what Toronto Public Health is undertaking to build resiliency against extreme heat in Toronto. Uh, next slide. So this presentation is going to cover four main themes. The first being uh, Toronto's future climate. The second is our surveillance efforts and understanding who in Toronto is vulnerable to extreme heat. Next, I'll touch on our hot weather response. And part of this is our cooling center program, as well as our newly formed heat relief network. And lastly, I'll talk about some policy activities that have been focused in apartment buildings without air conditioning. Uh, next slide. Toronto's future climate, sorry, Toronto's future climate is unlikely to resemble the conditions we've experienced in the past. We're going to be experiencing, according to our projections, more days with uh, higher maximum temperatures, as well as more days with uh, large amounts of rainfall. Uh, we're sort of getting a taste for some of these conditions now. In 2013, Toronto experienced record rainfall of more than 100 millimeters. Uh, for perspective, uh, our previous record was 30 millimeters. And this resulted in cascading power failures that resulted in a large portion of the city's population being without air conditioning for a prolonged period of time. As well, in 2016, we experienced a record number of extreme heat warnings, which resulted in changes to how the city responds to extreme heat. Uh, next slide. So I'm sure this has been covered already today, but heat-related illness is a continuum of symptoms that can range from heat stress and heat stroke to death, and is largely preventable through education and behavioral change. And understanding the true burden of illness is immensely challenging. As a result, when we talk about these sorts of things, we are often underestimating the true burden of illness due to the challenges associated with capturing this information. Uh, next slide. So Toronto Public Health describes vulnerability to extreme heat uh, in terms of exposure and sensitivity. Exposure being the outdoor ambient weather conditions, uh, urban heat island effects of where you happen to be within the city, and whether or not you have access to air conditioning and water. Sensitivity sort of refers to the age, the socioeconomic status, health status, and social con connectivity of an individual who happens to be exposed to extreme heat. And this can change over time. For example, certain medication classes have uh, 
direct effects on how the body responds to heat. Somebody can change their housing status, and as a result, their sensitivity may change. Uh, next slide. Many of the variables that I described on the previous slide have a spatial component associated with them in Toronto. Just to orient yourself to the south is Lake Ontario, and the map is showing sort of the intersection between the sensitivity and the exposure metrics. So we're looking at sort of uh, the urban heat island combined with uh, sensitivity issues, uh, including uh, socioeconomic status, disease status, as well as um, whether or not there's a tree canopy. So to orient you further, there's a central part in this map where we have a largely yellow area. And this has a very well-developed tree canopy and a population with a high socioeconomic status. Whereas those areas that are sort of red and orange, they have a less developed tree canopy and there are more apartments without air conditioning and a larger population of newcomers and those experiencing low incomes. Uh, next slide. So in terms of what we're capturing, like Toronto Public Health has undertaken a variety of studies looking at mortality, hospital admissions, 911 calls and emergency department visits. And these are the things that we're most likely to capture uh, in terms of heat related illness. The more subtle effects that likely affect a greater proportion of the population, such as physician office visits and like spontaneous resolution of subtle symptoms are simply not captured. So we don't have a good sense of what the actual shape of this pyramid is. But we do suspect that a large part, portion of the population is impacted by this way. Uh, next slide. Uh, this figure shows uh, the relationship between uh, heat related mortality and the number of days with temperatures above 30 degrees Celsius in Toronto between 1954 and about the year 2000. On average, on any given year, we have approximately 120 deaths associated with extreme heat. And in the red line, you'll see that's the number of days with uh, temperatures in excess of 30 degrees, and the black line is mortality. And you'll notice that some years have relatively low number of deaths, despite the fact that there are many days where the temperature is above 30 degrees. And in other years, you see a relatively high number of deaths relative to the number of days of extreme heat. So uh, next slide. And this has to do with the duration of the heat episode itself. So typically when we experience a few days of extreme heat, we do see uh, an increase in uh, daily mortality, but as the number of days in the episode increases, say past the week mark, we do start to see significantly more daily mortality as a result of exposure to, the, to heat. Uh, next slide. Uh, last year, Toronto Public <laughs> Health undertook an analysis of emergency department visits and 911 calls for heat-related illness between 2007 and 2016. And this analysis focused primarily on counts between May 1st and September 30th, or our traditional heat season. These data are separate, meaning that we don't actually know if an emergency uh, department visit was uh, also attached to an ambulance being dispatched. And we don't know if an, when an ambulance is dispatched, whether or not that person went to the hospital or if they just decided to stay home. So they have to be treated as separate data sets. Uh, for the emergency department visits, we saw the highest rate for people over the age of 80, which is pretty consistent with what other jurisdictions see. But we also, happened, we also saw that uh, there were a large number of visits for those between the ages of 20 and 29. In terms of the 911 calls, a similar age distribution was observed. And we were able to look at the spatial distribution of where these calls are occurring and found that they are primarily happening in and around the downtown core, primarily in July, which is our hottest month in Toronto. Uh, next slide. We also look at heat emergencies elsewhere and try to take as much information as possible from what other jurisdictions have to teach us. Uh, next slide. 
So heat warning systems, air conditioning, visiting places with air conditioning, social contact, these are all things that we have learned are protective. And when we develop policy related to extreme heat in the city, we try to incorporate as many of these protective factors as possible. Uh, next slide. So our harmonized alert and response system triggers are as follows. Daytime temperatures above 31 degrees, nighttime temperatures above 20, and a humidex above 40. And any combination of these factors results in a heat warning, which is forecasted to last two days, or an extended heat warning that is forecasted to last three days. Uh, next slide. Once a heat warning is triggered, uh, the city uh, activates its hot weather response plan, and it provides a framework for implementation and coordination of activities that are aimed at reducing the health effects related to extreme heat. This is a collaboration across many city divisions, and each division has its own role to play as part of this hot weather response plan, and Toronto Public Health sort of coordinates the uh, committee that is responsible for deploying the actions. The most visible component of our hot weather response plan is the cooling center program, and I'll get into a little more detail about that in future slides. Uh, and it's important to know that we also have a notification component to this plan, and we actually communicate with a thousand community agencies and individuals servicing vulnerable populations and the general public in order to make sure that the word gets out that extreme heat is forecasted. Next slide. This is a map of the current locations of the seven cooling centers. They are designated air conditioned spaces that are located at three community centers and four civic centers across the city. They are staffed by people with lived experience of homelessness and visitors have somewhere to sit, access to water and a snack. And while we know that spending time in an air conditioned environment during extreme weather is one of the most effective ways to reduce the health impacts, the geographical location of many of these sites limits access. As shown on this map, the cooling centers are distant from each other and many parts of the city are not well served. Uh, next slide. In 2017, Toronto Public Health was directed by the by City Council to evaluate the cooling center program. And as part of this evaluation, Toronto Public Health uh, conducted a jurisdictional scan and a survey of uh, cooling center users. The jurisdictional scan found examples of programs in other cities that maximize the number of facilities that are designated as cooling centers to form a large heat relief network. And they select facilities where people choose to spend their time and allocate resources to promote and coordinate the heat release network. Our survey of cooling center users was uh, fairly limited in 2017. We experienced a fairly uncharacteristically cool summer, and our cooling center program only operated for seven days in June and September, which is outside of our regular uh, operating uh, time frame. Usually we have more alerts in July and August. So we were only able to collect a small number of surveys and we, were, we, collect, we undertook an exploratory analysis and found that the majority of users had walked to the cooling center and it stayed for only a short period of time. Next slide. This is hot off the press from our Board of Health meeting that occurred on Monday, and we have approval to trial a heat relief network for the 2018 heat season. And this will be accomplished by the broader promotion of the city's libraries and community centers as locations to cool down. And potential locations that could be included in a heat relief network are shown on the map. And this illustrates how the access to cooling across the city can be maximized. These sites all have air conditioning and have access to seating and water. An advantage of this approach is that many of these locations are near where people live and are places and act where activities and programming occur. They are also facilities that people within their communities are already familiar with. And this addresses uh, reluctant uh, feedback we've received on a number of cases that people have nothing to do at a cooling center as they're often located in civic centers 
and that they're hesitant to travel to unfamiliar places. So in the future, the network can be expanded and we plan to explore relationships with other organizations with air conditioning, for example, provincial and federal buildings, museums and faith organizations. Uh, next slide. Uh, lastly, I'm going to touch on some of our work that we've been undertaking for a number of years related to uh, apartments without air conditioning. Uh, next slide. I should start by saying this is an immensely complicated pro uh, problem and there are no easy solutions, but I'm going to give you some background on it and some of the policy uh, activities that Toronto Public Health has undertaken. Uh, uh, the city has 1,200 older apartment buildings that were built between 1945 and 1984, and these are all greater than eight stories. They're home to 500,000 people, and many are experiencing low incomes. These buildings were uh, constructed at a time without ductwork, and insulation is insufficient to allow central air conditioning to be installed and operated effectively. And because of the building code, Ontario Building Code regulations, the windows can only be open 10 centimeters because people have fallen out in the past and that was the response. So you can just imagine the conditions that can quickly develop in these buildings where the person cannot open their window, the building is not air conditioned and it's 31 degrees or more outside and it's obviously sweltering inside. Uh, next slide. Many tenants in apartment buildings without air conditioning rely on window units and they're often installed in haphazard ways. Uh, shown in this picture on the right, uh, this air conditioner is supported by VHS cassette tapes. And you can also see that the window is not sealed around the air conditioner, so it's literally trying to cool the space, but it's probably not terribly effective. So when we are developing policy where our goals are to protect the health of vulnerable people and to identify solutions that do not financially burden vulnerable tenants and hopefully minimize energy consumption. Next slide. In addition, there is a huge income difference between who has access to air conditioning and who does not. Approximately 15% of Toronto residents do not have air conditioning in their home. However, they're much more likely to be of low income, rent, live in apartment buildings or community housing. As a result, there is an equity lens that can be applied to access to cooling within the city. Next slide. In 2016, we surveyed condo and apartment residents about their experiences related to extreme heat, and apartment residents were much more likely to report using a window air conditioning unit. And as you can see from this figure, almost half of people that do not own an air conditioner say that cost is the major barrier for them to um, own one. Next slide. So what is Toronto Public Health doing about all of this? As building science isn't exactly the area of expertise of public health, so what we try to do as much as possible is advocate for building retrofits. That's really the only way that we're going to be able to address these apartment buildings in a systematic way. We also advocate uh, to landlords to designate cool rooms within their buildings, so that would include uh, perhaps providing air conditioning in a party room or a lobby. And we also advocate for outdoor cool spaces, meaning a shaded area or a water feature or something where uh, residents can go to cool down near their home. Uh, we also have a bylaw that was recently implemented that, uh, that mandates landlords post the location of the nearest air conditioned library or community center in their lobby on an information board. And this is part of the, a broader landlord registration process where we're going to get a lot more information about these buildings and hopefully develop a better understanding of what can be done related to extreme heat. 
Lastly, we partnered with a association that covers most of the landlords in Toronto and distributed 125,000 educational resources about recognizing the symptoms of heat-related illness and how to keep their apartment units cool. Next slide. So in summary, as Toronto's climate changes, extreme heat episodes may become more common. And we're actively engaged in population surveillance, vulnerability mapping, and policy development in areas related to extreme heat. And there are many opportunities for policy development focused on vulnerable populations, hot weather response, and buildings without air conditioning. Next slide. All right, so that's my presentation. I realized that it was very high level and very quick. So if you have any further questions and you'd like to follow up with me, I'm happy to have a chat. Thank you. Does anybody in the room have one or two questions, and then we might um, move on to our next presenter? Sure, I got one. Thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Toronto, with the uh, many towers that don't have air conditioning, I'm thinking like, was the option of a fan uh, presented? Um, I'm thinking Southeast Asia. There's not very much air conditioning there, and it just about every room, even low budget, have have a, a fan. So that's an interesting question. And one part component of this is, uh, yes, many tenants will have a fan, but after a certain temperature, they are not exactly effective. In fact, I think after a certain temperature, they become somewhat dangerous. I'm not entirely certain of that, but if the temperature inside the room is 34 degrees and you have a fan on you, I think it has something to do with the water uh, evaporating off the surface of your skin. Um, but we have uh, also a, like we have contacts with our Toronto Community Housing Corporation colleagues and we investigated installing ceiling fans in some of their units and it turns out that many apartment buildings that were built in this era do not have uh, a place to install them other than over a dining room table, sort of like dining area. And as you can well imagine, many tenants don't ex exactly want that because that's where they sit to eat. And if having airflow of that nature over that kind of space is undesirable to them, like ideally it would be in a bedroom, but they often lack the electrical hookup to enable this to happen. So it's immensely tricky in short. Thank you. Hi, Kelly. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how um, Toronto Public Health facilitated the transportation program for um, maybe transporting at-risk individuals. So we're not actively doing that at this time. So was it, was it something you did in the past? It's something that occurred in the past as part of our hot weather response plan when it was under so there are various components of our hot weather response plan and different parts of it had uh, different owners in the past. And our, I believe the transportation component to it was an actual, ex like an external partner and they no longer they decided to participate. I don't actually believe it was city operated. Okay, thanks. Uh, Kelly, just a quick question here. Um, earlier in your presentation, you spoke to the presence of uh, an urban tree canopy as being a mitigating factor for heat. Do you work with the planning or engineering departments, or is there any uh, advocating um, for increases in that can canopy for um, health, health reasons or to deal with, uh, with heat impacts? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we have an ongoing program related to increasing green space within the city and we work with planning, uh, parks, forestry and recreation and a few other divisions to ensure that we uh, continue to develop our tree canopy. Uh, one other small part of that is uh, we want to ensure that there's diversity of trees planted as there is a strong incentive within the city to only plant one or two types of trees because they uh, tend to survive the harsh salt conditions that happen in the winter time and our heat when they're uh, smaller. So we're also advocating for sort of a biodiversity of trees. 
Thank you. Welcome. Sean Donaldson from, from Health Canada, and uh, one of the things I guess I'm just trying to understand a little bit better is uh, the relationship between uh, a heat message and uh, some of the health uh, promotion work that you're doing and uptake with the public. And uh, one of the things we've just been talking about in this meeting, and, and I've kind of seen in other parts of the public health field, is, is uh, fatigue, like with messages. And I just wondered if you could just talk a little bit about um, how you handle that in Toronto and also like if you feel like is the public generally pretty um, receptive to the messages and to some of the uh, efforts that, that you've done like uh, the cooling centers and, and other things? So we try to time our messaging strategically. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. So we don't promote all summer when we think that we're approaching a heat episode like this summer, one thing we're going to do is do an educational sort of media outreach where ideally our medical officer of health will uh, talk about heat and ways to cool down. So we're trying to engage people through television, radio, uh, social media, so that different uh, populations within the city access the message. We do know that our senior population is more likely to get the information from newspapers uh, or traditional television or radio, so we make sure that we incorporate messaging in that way. We also have print resources, and we try to target a different group each year. So last year, we had a large push in apartment buildings without air conditioning. And one reason for that was a partner was willing to help distribute 125,000 of them to member buildings. So we jumped at the opportunity to put our resource in those buildings. But that's not something we're going to do this year, not because of a lack of uptake, but just to make sure that the message stays fresh. So this summer, we're changing the way that we respond to extreme heat. So the messaging won't necessarily result in fatigue because it's completely new. We're promoting our libraries and community centers. We have a heat relief network now approved on Monday. So that's the messaging that's going to go this year. And we're hopeful that it will be well received. Great. great. Thanks, Lada. Yeah, it's, it's really amazing work. So thank you. I may follow up with you after, Kelly, just with uh, some linkages to Health Canada, if that's okay. Of course. Hi there, it's Charlie right. in place of Tony. Thank you so much. Um, do you uh, mind introducing yourself too? Uh, yes, I do. I need to take over controls, or are you able to um, move the slides for me? I can move slides if you like. Yeah, that would be great, actually. Okay, okay so. Um, Thank you very much for having me and I've been able to listen to the last few presentations. So it seems like there's a really great mix of um, all the different initiatives that are going on. And it's kind of, it's excellent to be paired uh, with an urban initiative and, and now we'll talk a little bit more of a rural initiative. So my name is Darlene Oshansky. I work for public health uh, within Manitoba. My former office was with the Office of Disaster Management where Toni Morris Oswald uh, currently works and she sends her apologies and regrets. She currently has laryngitis so wouldn't be able to present this. Um, and I hope I can do it justice. Uh, she's been involved with the program since it started in 2009. I became involved in uh, 2013 and have had a different role in this. Um, so I will walk you through the slides and give you a little bit of experience of what it looked like uh, in rural Manitoba, some of the challenges and learnings. So next slide. So in terms of how we uh, introduce the risk to our stakeholders, uh, especially in the rural areas, 
uh, was presenting the evidence. We worked a lot with Health Canada. We had their support and a lot of their expertise. Um, we also struck a HARS advisory committee. So that was integral to bring our stakeholders together to be able to start thinking about the risk and looking at what was currently out there. Um, and that incorporated both rural and, uh, and urban perspectives. Um, and the other piece was the piloting of HARS in the rural and urban areas with our regional health authorities. We were able to have one um, with our Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, as well as um, what was Assiniboine, and I know that was in a few presentations ago. It's now called uh, Prairie Mountain Health, um, and they are still doing a lot of the work that they, they set out um, on in the beginning of 2009, and um, it really helped with that buy-in, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So in terms of the HARS working groups, um, from years one to four, uh, we had a heat science group. So that comprised of um, some of our medical officers of health, Health Canada, Environment Canada, um, and Tony. Um, there was also a surveillance and, and data group, and that was um, comprised of Health Canada components, as well as epidemiology from within Manitoba Health. And then there was a communications group. So um, within there, we had um, somebody from mental health um, and someone from our provincial communications uh, to help us work on, on some of that. The HARS components in general, um, it centers a lot around education and outreach, and, and that's talking about the non-event um, type education and outreach. It's more of that um, familiarization with, with the risk and knowing what the hazards and issues are associated. Um, then it moves more so into what we do uh, in terms of our risk assessments and our heat warning activation thresholds. And um, I know you're all aware our thresholds have changed this, this year. So within Manitoba, we now have two levels, um, a climate zone in the north and south and triggers that reflect those differences. Um, we've adapted our notification protocols since the beginning. Uh, there's been small changes based on um, emerging evidence. And then again, with last year's change in the pilot of the new system with um, with Meteorological Services Canada and Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, so we create those for both our duty officers as well as our MOH on call. Um, we also have event-based communication. So those are more of, um, of our advisories that are sent out as well as the messaging that's embedded within um, Twitter and Facebook that we're currently using. Um, we also have developed our response activities, so that's a lot of the, the work at the HARSAC where we get together and we determine what every organization is doing during an event, uh, the regional health authorities, the non-governmental organizations, um, and then data collection and adaptation of the system. That's, that's a place where we've had a bit of a challenge, but we luckily are able to rely on other jurisdictions in Health Canada to assist us with that. Next slide. So the foundations for our extreme heat plan, um, it's based on educating health and the municipal staff in terms of the, the heat risk. We really need that buy-in and, and that's why our pilot communities were really integral in, in getting to the sort of the essence of those communities and some of the stakeholders and getting them to understand what it was and have them work with us. Um, that relates to the ownership. So um, when we're talking about extreme heat planning, it can't just be within health. Uh, we were the ones who partnered with Health Canada in the beginning and received the funding to, to sort of get our feet off the ground. But um, I think others have looked at us as a leader, but it's, it's more, <laughs> it is a health hazard, but it quickly becomes a, um, a hazard that, that lies with municipalities as well, since a lot of the resources um, are within their pu purview. Um, so then talking about municipal plans, um, there's been a hesitancy to want to, um, from their perspective, um, start activating some of these things on their own. They want a declaration from us. Two years ago, we had the city of Winnipeg uh, approach us and say, you know what, if you could call a heat emergency, that would be great because then, you know, that would give us the the um, ability to open cooling centers, that sort of thing. So we've been working with them since and, and trying to create a relationship where we don't need to um, to state something like that. It's, it's more of what we're using in terms of our extended heat warning and that uh, these different entities need to understand what their own thresholds are for activation. It's not just we push a button and everybody goes. Um, our, our regional health authorities go a lot sooner than our municipalities would. Uh, the vulnerable populations that live within their health facilities they have different plans that need to be activated a lot sooner than a municipality would. So um, through time, we've been building that understanding and I think we're, we're slowly getting there. And then it's a clarification of roles within the health sector. So every um, level we need to understand, you know, who's responsible for what, what are they doing, and then who's leading on the communication side, especially. Next slide. 
So this is an example of uh, Prairie Mountain Health is what I was men mentioning earlier as uh, one of the sites for our pilot community within Melita. Um, this is uh, one of their response checklists that they created and they're able to activate and, and use. Um, it's a direction to all staff. It's based on our current heat alert uh, process and it also determines um, um, what needs to happen between a heat warning and an extended heat warning and uh, something that we uh, mentioned I think last night as well is that um, we weren't aware that Environment Canada wasn't using the extended heat warnings. There was a lot of changes last year and I think we lost that somewhere in the translation but um, that's really that's a that's a health um, warning level so now we're aware that if, if we exceed that threshold of um, two plus days then we need to move into the extended heat warning and be issuing our messages um, in relation to that. Um, this heat checklist also talks about uh, some of the community-based actions, um, with, especially within that regional health authority, and some of that are the modified home assessments. So when workers are going out um, and dealing with their home care clients, they're able to do different assessments on various levels um, and look at that vulnerable population and see if there's anything they need to do. Next slide. So working with communities, some of our learnings um, the profiles of the communities are incredibly important. Every community is different. Um, you can't create a, a one-size-fits-all. Um, and I would suspect this would be of, of all um, provinces, but it feels especially strong in Manitoba. Um, heat is one of the numerous priorities that a lot of communities are dealing with, especially when we're trying to work with municipalities. Um, it's A lot of these people are doing this work off the side of their desk, and, and heat is one... Um, people really in this province cherish and they don't see it as, as an issue and luckily we haven't had an extreme event to the extent that um, you know it's really um, stuck in people's minds and hearts um, floods and fires are something that we um, you know see on a seasonal basis every year and heat just seems to be um, a byproduct of summer which everyone loves here so um, it's re it's really tough to get that by in, in, in some of our municipalities the capacities of communities are also really uh, variable. That sort of relates to the profiles. You need to really understand what's in the community, how people communicate, who their leaders are, whether it's informal or formal, um, and then realize whether or not maybe some of them are reliant. We have um, we have a few cities uh, within Manitoba, but everything is really centered around Winnipeg, and a lot of our smaller communities and rural areas are, um, are are experiencing issues where they don't have the same assets that they once did so they really rely on on their closely situated urban centers and some of that's just not going to be feasible if we see uh, an extreme heat event so we need to look at what some of their capacities are and then again when we're seeing heat in conjunction with to other risks whether it be smoke or flood um, we're going to have to um, be required to assess some of these situations and recommend actions um, we had the situation um, in our flood in 2011. Um, we had people sandbagging and it was incredibly hot and there was no thought at that time to, to the fact that although they're trying to prevent water from entering communities, these people are becoming dehydrated. So, um, you know, moving resources in and working with Salvation Army to have water trucks and ensure that they're hydrating themselves and seeking shade and taking breaks, those sort of preventative actions. Um, it was sort of lost on the larger hazard, which people typically think about. Next slide. Um, now a little bit more about capacity and resources. Some of the things that we need to identify and look at is what is available in the community to plan for and respond to these events, what conditions may compromise a response, and, and how can residents be protected locally. So looking at some of their health resources, are there healthcare services in their community available locally? <coughs> Um, do they have uh, pharmacies where they can get guidance? Um, pharmacies are, are an integral part of some of our smaller um, towns within Manitoba. Uh, looking at heat-related risks, um, Tony was mentioning last night that uh, they were at a meeting um, a few years ago and, and the power went out. And But it's, it's a typical thing. Nobody was really surprised by it. But um, in that instance, it didn't matter. But when you're looking at air conditioning and, and relying on, on that sort of coping, uh, mechanism. If the power goes out on a regular basis, that's something that has to be considered. And then um, the modified home assessments, again, by regional staff, um, that's incredibly important. It's it's really difficult to sometimes um, get to our home care clients. There isn't a registry. We don't have a, a good sense of where they always are, so that's something we're working on. But having regional health authorities take that lead and understand that if they can do some of that work and prevent some of those issues, um, that's going to help.
responsible for larger healthcare system as well. Next slide. So um, key response components. So when we're looking at a local uh, response, we want to look at pre-identifying some of the cooling centers, air conditioning within buildings, splash pads, um, public or private venues. We want to make sure we have bottled water distribution plans, um, whether that's provided by fire, um, paramedics, um, whether or not it's Red Cross or Salvation Army in most cases within here, um, or if it's municipal employees or volunteers. Um, we're trying to look at an identification of uh, vulnerable populations. Um, do we have service, service providers with plans and adequate resources? Can we do wellness checks? We know that if some of, if we get into an extreme event, we're going to need to be knocking on doors, and, and who, are we gonna, who is going to be available to do that um, is something that we're looking at identifying. Community boundaries, um, accounting for vulnerable or isolated. Um, a large part of our population are actually not even situated in towns. They're, they live on gravel roads, and um, you know a lot of them tend to want to be isolated uh, for their own reasons. And it's it's not that everybody knows them in the town. It's it's sometimes an issue. So it's how to find other mechanisms. When we were dealing with the flood in 2011, one of the things that we used were um, com community information sessions, and we had food and beverages. And you know sometimes things like that are are what you need to get people out and get people talking and understanding some of these things. So um, you know finding mechanisms that we can use to to reach the people that we wouldn't typically reach. And then looking at larger events. Um, so we had the Canada Summer Games last year, um, but we weren't uh, involved in the process soon enough to to get a heat plan, something that we were working with with the organizers. Um, we did look at some of the aspects of cooling and hydration and the safety for um, spectators, volunteers, and athletes. Um, but that's something that needs to occur as early as possible, and that's one of our learnings that I'll talk about later. Uh, we want to integrate local industry as much as possible and um, look at some of the worker issues um, that we deal with. Um, and then in messaging, uh, it's who, what, where, and um, who, what, when, and where do we want to message uh, because we don't want to be doing that message fatigue either. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about how we try to avoid that in most cases. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of our in cooling locations, um, this is something that uh, we're moving ahead on and we're um, it's becoming a little bit easier to do, but I don't think we're to the extent um, that I think Toronto or uh, some areas in BC are. Um, we have challenges with the size of some of our local venues. Um, there's issues with who has the responsibility to set them up and maintain them. Um, what hours of operation do we maintain? Transportation, um, how do we get handy vans? How do we get other forms of transportation to move people back and forth? I think it's a really great point. Of, once you get people to a cooling center as well, what do they do there? So um, that's something that I've noted and, and we'll need to look at considering as well. When we're looking more at our pools, water park spray pads, um, there's a, a, a real hesitancy to maybe expand the hours in some cases. That's why the city of Winnipeg was looking at us to declare something, to, to allow them to maybe dip into their savings a little bit more to be able to do this. Um, looking at the surrounding areas of some of these, uh, the, um, the most beneficial areas that we have. So um, now moving forward as the city and other municipalities are looking at building these, we're trying to be involved somewhat and in, you know, ensuring that there's there's trees that are planted in shaded areas um, <coughs> when their kids are cooling off in the actual um, spray pad or in the water park. And then uh, with private dwellings, um, air conditioning is, is a concern for those in fixed in incomes and the safety in apartments without air conditioning. There's nothing that we're doing in the city of Winnipeg, to our knowledge, um, that even looks at um, uh, where some of these buildings are that don't have air conditioning. Uh, we're really not to that extent, and um, I wish we were, um, but it's something that we're going to hopefully consider and, and maybe build some partnerships around looking at in the future. Next slide. So around leadership and social capacity, um, I talked a little bit about formal, informal leadership. In terms of the informal, um, these small communities, uh, they can be really in tune uh, to the needs of their community members. So, you know, trying to, to pull that information and get it together and determining what their community profile is and then, and what their capacities are. Uh, also looking at local health staff. They are seeing community members on a daily basis, and when they're assessing their health needs, they're getting a, a broader picture of, of what some of the issues that they're facing within these communities um, from a health and sort of environmental perspective. So um, 
they're a great source of information. And volunteers as well are a great resource. Um, you just need to make sure that you provide them with the, the direction and support that they need. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the formal leadership, um, we talked about this a little bit as well. Um, the emergency management function um, within a lot of these communities is quite taxed and um, has a hard time prioritizing heat amongst other um, competing issues. So uh, we really try to tell them, you know, we're here to help them. There's um, provincial emergency managers that are available as well. Um, this is an area that we're working on trying to build. Um, but we're definitely not there yet. Um, probably our regional health authorities have been the largest asset. They have some of those relationships with rural municipalities, so there's a greater comfort level in, in talking about some of the issues within the areas that they live in and asking them for help, so that's occurred in some instances, but um, we definitely need to, to continue um, on this path and, and get a little further. Next date, or next slide, please. Um, so in terms of what we did with one of our pilot communities, the, the one that um, was in Prairie Mountain Health, formerly Assiniboine, um, that one regional health person um, was incredibly beneficial. They worked with us in Health Canada. They led on the regional health uh, checklist and education. Um, they actually created the coloring sheet in the middle of the, the slide there. Um, they engage various sectors at the community level, something that is incredibly hard for us to do um, from the city of Winnipeg, reaching out to the far southwestern uh, corner of the province. And they were able to develop targeted local messaging, which is huge. Next slide. And then moving on a little bit more out of the rural and more so into the broader um, um, sort of issues and, and experiences that we have within um, the the hazard of heat is uh, probably the challenge of messaging. So my role within public health um, is really a, a communication role. Um, I try to facilitate some of the relationships so that we are moving into the 21st century and using social media and infographics, Facebook, Twitter, um, that we're trying to update our website much more regularly, um, that now we're tying our media releases to Environment um, and Climate Change Canada's um, notices that go out. So we're working closely with them and our messages are actually in tandem with one another. We know when they're issuing them, our messages are already embedded in theirs. And then when we issue ours, we're really reiterating what they're saying. And we try only to do that in terms of uh, like Chief Provincial Public Health um, Officer heat advisory when it's it's going to be substantive. So that would be an extended heat warning when we really need to look at other um, resources and, and, and turning it more into a response. Um, so I think I touched base on the, the same information um, and also that it all references our, our guidelines and our recommendations. And again, other than you know 911 and emergent issues, we're really promoting um, the use of our health links, which is our telehealth um, service and advice line. Next slide. Um, in terms of Northern Manitoba this year, so having the two different um, climate zones and the two different levels of, of thresholds was incredibly advantageous to us because we did see most of our Northern Manitoba and under our former um, thresholds, I don't think they would have met it, um, which is incredibly unfortunate because the climatization and the issues that they face um, to climate change, um, this is going to be uh, an issue that just becomes more and more prevalent. So uh, there was uh, communities that in the north that saw up to 10 days of heat warning. Um, one of our largest events actually occurred on a weekend, which made it more difficult um, to communicate. But luckily, we had our regional medical officer of health, who um, was incredibly passionate about the issue, worked with our one of our regional health disaster managers, and together they worked with all of the local networks to make sure that um, we were using Facebook, Twitter, linking onto some of the community sites, some of the more informal um, networks of communication, and, and got the message out. Um, we really didn't have a lot of response or options for such a large geographic area, so it was really integral that we had those relationships to work with. Um, what counters to some of that is that because we hadn't issued warnings in the past, this alarms some of the people. Um, we don't have a lot of resources here that are working on heat right now, and, and that's something that we noted is uh, when we moved into this new system, we definitely should have been doing more um, communication of risk and education on it, um, but it's something that didn't occur, and, um, and it really was detrimental to some of the citizens because they were quite concerned about why all of a sudden they would be getting messages related to heat. Um, 
the community Facebook pages um, were used more than that of regional health. That wasn't really a um, something we knew that that was um, an issue that we face up there, but it also was an opportunity because we knew how to link onto those and were able to. Um, had simultaneous conditions of wildland fire smoke, um, so that presented issues as well. And um, it just really, again, reiterated the need that um, now that we're, we've moved into this new system um, and we have this opportunity, we really need to provide the education uh, to support it. Next slide. So moving forward, um, so just the last few slides, it, it relates a lot to, to what we're um, pointing towards and, and trying to work towards is clarifications of our different roles, whether it's provincial health, regional health, municipal. Um, we need to be mitigating the heat health risk and working together to do that, and we need to understand what, what we're all doing and what our role is in the bigger picture. Um, we, need, we need to also work on the, the component of educating the officers of health. Um, we, we have some... We have quite a few medical officers of health and they have a breadth of knowledge and um, experience, but not all of them necessarily feel comfortable with sort of the heat related illness and preventative measure aspects. So we need to make sure that they're aware of what their roles are during events and also um, to reinforce the um, importance of providing additional messaging. That's something that we need to, we should be doing in advance of events. Oftentimes it's during an event and that's not always the best time. Um, so we need to make sure that we're, we're getting out and using the media to our advantage. Um, looking at expanding our capacity to capture heat-related illness and mortality, um, data as it relates to environmental conditions, um, that's always been a gap in our province and, and we're going to continue to work on improving that. Um, we also want to expand public awareness of the risk. Like I said before, people really enjoy the summer, they don't want to hear about heat warnings, they don't want to be told not to, to doing what they're, they want to do in our, our few summer months that they can enjoy. Um, so it's really our job to make sure that they better understand the risks so they know that we're not trying to rain on anyone's parade, we're really just trying to prevent those, those illnesses and premature deaths that we see with heat-related events. Next slide. Um, we need to establish a more health-focused and timely process for working with organizing committees. I mentioned this earlier in terms of the Canada Summer Games. Um, we didn't get involved with the organizing committee in the beginning. Um, we didn't have an opportunity to influence some of the venues where the sporting events took place. So we did have issues where um, there weren't adjacent facilities that had air conditioning. Some of them didn't have shade. Um, so, and they didn't have plans for, for being able to provide water. So uh, it made for a lot of work in a short period of time to try to come on board and, and kind of throw together a few interventions that were able to support it. We also couldn't um, implement a surveillance system within their heat um, or within their health teams. And that was a disadvantage because we actually had um, a less severe heat event during the time of the summer games, but it was more of one of our more substantial in terms of our summer. And it would have been good to collect that data. A lot of it was really just anecdotal. Um, and so that really doesn't go forward in trying to, us trying to gather uh, useful information to move forward and, and create some good lessons learned. Um, and the other thing is we need to look at using multiple strategies and tools, um, a means to support northern and rural communities, um, look at that communication piece and, and um, how do we improve some of that for these areas, supporting local communities and RHAs, um, we have to increase planning and response capacity because we haven't seen large scale events and um, we won't be ready um, when one does occur unless we really engage some of those other communities that we haven't been able to reach out to. And we have to continue to look for and adopt best practices through work with um, our provincial government and other national partners and being parts of um, the part of um, these last two nights of this educational piece, getting to hear from other jurisdictions, this is huge and, and it really helps us and motivates us to keep going. We've been doing this for almost 10 years, but um, the push was really in the beginning and it's been more difficult to keep people engaged in the momentum going. But as other jurisdictions are moving forward and, and making leaps and bounds, it really does help us in being able to point over to that and say, you know, look at what Toronto's doing, look at what BC's doing. You know, there's ways that we can do this as well. So I really appreciate uh, you inviting us to this call and being a part of this. And I think the next slide should be a question slide. Thank you, Ms. Uh, 
Darlene, uh, what's the role of First Nations and Inuit health in this in Manitoba with First Nations communities? Unfortunately, there hasn't been much of a role. Um, we work with them through um, Emergency Measures Organization as well as Red Cross, um, but there hasn't been a formal role, and that's one of the uh, that's another gap that actually should have been up on there. It's just uh, it's been nine years of of trying to be able to um, work with communities from a provincial perspective. Um, there's just a lot of linkages with um, Indigenous communities, and that's a huge disadvantage. I think Tony and I are just um, you know really saddened by the fact that this is you know it's one of the challenges that have been occurring for nine years, and there hasn't been a lot of momentum shift. Um, Finally, with climate change, uh, another portfolio that we're working on that clearly relates um, directly to heat, uh, there are some linkages. So I think using that avenue, we're maybe going to get, um, you know, opportunities, further opportunities to work with some of these communities. Another question I had is the uh, Manitoba was pretty flat mostly, and the, when the uh, temperature uh, sort of fronts are, are fairly uh, wide, uh, fairly large. In size so to what degree do you need local initiatives versus sort of provincial or sub provincial initiatives given a heat event yeah I see what you mean um, it's I think it's more so in terms of the, the resourcing um, we need the municipalities to be able to have in their plans you know heat annexes and and be able to we do we do most of the messaging Whenever we do issue a heat advisory, for the most part, it is for the province because, like you say, it covers a, a large breadth of the province. So it's not like we're looking at little small sections and advising just for those areas. Um, but because most of our resources and assets are in Winnipeg, we need to be able to connect with the rural areas and, and some of the resources that they have. Even a lot of our NGOs are based out of Winnipeg, and it's incredibly difficult for us to get them out there in, in the timelines that we would need them. And again, if we saw a large enough event that affected the city of Winnipeg, which is, you know, 70% of the population, um, unfortunately, the resources are going to be allocated to the large urban center, and we need them to be self-sufficient. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, thank you. Oh, it's uh, Sean Donaldson from Health Canada, and uh, one of the the um, uh, initiatives we're, we're trying to work on is we're trying to work with the Yukon and Northwest Territories on implementing AHARS and we're working with uh, Dave and Mel at Environment Canada um, on, on that as well and I just wondered if um, you had maybe any insights I was just sort of interested really in, in northern Manitoba and I, I lived in uh, Flim Flon Manitoba for two years and one of the things that really struck me is, is sort of how quickly it gets hot in the summertime and then with the longer days it can it can stay hot for quite a while uh, especially in, in July and I just wondered um, for your heat alert response system like how like you, you you talked about it but I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about some of the challenges and maybe opportunities that, that you have um, and that you're facing in northern Manitoba one of the largest issues is that we don't have a lot of information. We don't even actually have a lot of anecdotal information. Um, I worked on the, the wildland fire smoke um, portfolio and we used to get phone calls from nursing stations and they would let us know when people were there um, in relation to you know smoke inhalation and some of the issues relating to smoke. We don't hear anything about heat. And that's really, um, that's a scary notion. We don't know nearly enough. It wasn't until we actually issued this first heat advisory for the North that we got any sort of feedback. And it was more so that people were concerned of the risk. They weren't quite aware of the risk. Um, I think to the extent that we were promoting it and talking about it. Um, so the information that you are giving me is is news. I, I wasn't aware of that. Um, and we just honestly don't have those linkages at all and aren't getting into that, any of that feedback. So if you're able to work with um, some of the territories, that would be incredibly advantageous to us because um, then maybe that gives us an opportunity um, to look at some of these things and be able to engage with our northern um, Manitoba com communities and have an idea of what of what it looks like before we get there and see some of these issues. I, I don't know what that level of engagement is going to be at this point in time. Um, there isn't a clear path. Um, so I just... 
really excited at the thought that you're you're you have the opportunity to do some of this work and maybe that's going to be able to um, spur us to work with our northern Manitoba counterparts as well. well I'd be happy to keep in touch. Um, uh, we went uh, north. Uh, Health Canada and the and the Environment Canada went north uh, to the Yukon and Northwest Territory in December, and uh, we've got a few follow-up meetings planned in April. So what I could do is just offline, I'll, um, I'll send you an email and we can keep in touch uh, about that. And uh, and then just because I lived in northern Manitoba, I've got a, a really big interest in it. And so uh, maybe we could kind of uh, exchange best practices and try and see if we could help each other. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for that. No problem. <laughs> Down the line, or is that to me? Back to the um, uh, how to support Indigenous populations and communities in, in advancing heat responses. Do, do you have any thoughts about about that? So you said it's a challenge, but in terms of um, not not only uh, ideas for for supporting Indigenous communities in Manitoba, but but in other provinces about um, how perhaps to, to, to start that engagement process and, um, uh, and, and move forward with supporting uh, populations. In terms of other hazards, we've, um, we've used some of our, um, our first members like the Red Cross um, who've actually been able to um, work within focus groups and talk to communities. <laughs> and gain some information in terms of risk communication and wildland fire smoke. So I would see that as one of the avenues that we could take. Um, and honestly, we're very open to any suggestions that anyone would have at this point in time. Um, unfortunately, Tony and I, um, we do this um, sort of in the 10% of our daily work spectrum. So it's it's also needing to, to find other people that, um, that can do this work with us. Um, it's, it's just one of the issues that we're facing. So we haven't been able to dedicate the, the type of time that we would like to um, to some of this. And um, yeah, so and any information that um, can be provided about approaches, um, I'm just as curious as you are. I, I, it's not something we've really been able to do. We we've tried to work. We'd had an um, Aboriginal and Northern Health Office, but they're pulled into so many other priorities whenever we vote. Um, environmental risks like heat and, and smoke, it seems to be, like municipalities, the last thing they can think of. So, Perhaps if I can then kind of um, extend that to anybody in the room or, or on the line, if they, if ideas, because I, I guess I'm, I'm really, and I think our Bureau is really interested in engaging um, Indigenous populations about protecting, uh, protecting the communities from heat. I'm wondering if, if there's ideas um, on, on that. Hi there, this is uh, Linda from Environmental Health at First Nations Health Authority. Um, I'm just thinking of a few opportunities and I guess structures uh, that exist in BC in relation to um, regular uh, conference calls that occur through the um, Health Protection Nursing Program with community health nurses in community. Um, the Health Directors Association potentially, um, and, and maybe taking on some of that um, education awareness to existing um, existing venues that they may already be participating in, um, just to ease some of the burden of, um, again, everybody traveling out of community for workshops and things like that. So how can we bring it to community through existing venues that already are there? Thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you again. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I think we're just going to go through like a five-minute presentation now on what uh, the tool that BCCDC has developed for small and medium-sized municipalities. And then we'll just open it up to general questions. While you're doing that, thanks, Darlene, for doing it, um, for delivering your presentation so late because it's later there in Manitoba. Yes, thank, thank you, Darlene, and also yeah. Kelly. Oh, so, 
from last year, the CCDC um, did a scan of, of BC to find out where where actually had extreme heat plants and extreme heat strategies. And what we found was that only about six municipalities actually have an extreme heat plant. And those that do are generally located in the coastal area. Uh, a lot of the community were actually quite interested in the idea, but felt they either didn't have enough human resources or physical or monetary resources. So we came up with a little guide to help um, put heat preparedness into already existing emergency plans. Um, so the first um, bit of it comes into asset mapping, basically what do you have in your municipality. And looking at infrastructure, we've already heard a lot today about cooling centers. So what can you keep a list? Well, things like libraries, uh, schools, community centers that you go to um, that are air conditioned. And we also heard of partnering with different community groups that might be able to uh, transport people in more vulnerable populations to these kind of areas. Uh, in Ottawa, they at least used to work with the Salvation Army to do that. And cooling centers can also be places for people to get water. So in Metro Vancouver, they actually have portable water stations on the river, I guess, that they can move around. Um, we also, well, they have a, an online tool that shows the people um, and the public, but also municipal officials, et cetera, where there are publicly available accessible water stations. And also, who in your area could you partner with that might be able to provide bottled water to homeless populations or vulnerable people. And we also heard a lot today about um, providing temporary air conditioning to certain buildings that are more vulnerable, help the more vulnerable people, or mandating cool rooms, communal, communal spaces in the center apartment buildings. <coughs> Probably one of the most important things that we've heard is mapping who your partners are. Who in your community already works with those vulnerable populations that might be able to get the message out and might be able to support them? So what organizations in your community work with seniors or new Canadians that might have language barriers or low-income families, um, people living in social housing, more socially isolated people, or homeless? And some of the more common partners in the, that have been used in planning have been fire officials, the Red Cross, Meals on Wheels, home support staff, staff at senior centers, people that are already close to populations that are going to feel it. And of course, communication is a as well. And communication can be developed with the aid of public health officials. Um, we have heard a little bit about potentially working together to get um, to get those resources together. And municipal websites are a great place for your population to get information. Uh, and including messaging like look out for each other. And Prepared BC has a unit which helps uh, communities and neighborhoods get together and figure out how to get to know their neighbors so they can all be prepared and check on each other. Um, not only in extreme heat events, but other other disasters. And also you on your website where cooling shelters are and how to get there. Uh, paper materials can be distributed to places where vulnerable populations would already be frequenting, like uh, community centers, schools, low-income housing areas, uh, pharmacies, and medical centers. And where school, it's helpful to have uh, pictorial and multilingual messaging. And for long-term heat mitigation strategies, some of the best practices we've heard of is uh, preserving and expanding tree canopies and improving the connectivity of green space, building shade structures in more heat vulnerable zones, especially where the more vulnerable populations are. Building and building in incentive programs to fund green roofs or cool roof projects if possible in municipality. Um, again, cooling rooms and non-market housing for more vulnerable populations. And increasing access to public drinking fountains, just in general, as well as for more rural locations, having a strategy in place to ensure that residents who don't uh, live on a municipal water system can have access to drinking water because in the hot seasons, their uh, water.
sources may dry up. And so in this toolkit, we also have more on how these work into your existing plans and additional resources that are, are helpful for background information, et cetera. And so you can find um, this particular kit. Um, you can see here's info and air quality, and we have some of our other resources there as well. And um, I'll open up for other questions, but just to let everybody know, this session was being recorded, and so as long as all the presenters are okay with it, uh, we will be able to share that. Um, and we also have all the which I can send out. Do you have any questions? <clears throat> and thank you, everybody, for um, for bearing in there. I know this is a, a very long session. And also to the folks who uh, came online after not being able to yesterday, uh, really appreciate your patience. Hi, it's, it's, it's uh, Sean Wilson from Health Canada. And I think that that's a really great guide. And I'm just kind of thinking about getting that message out across Canada because I bet there's a lot of other regions that would be kind of interested in seeing it. And given that we've got a heat season coming up, um, I'm just wondering, um, in Gregory's presentation, he talked about the community of practice uh, that uh, um, we, we host, and uh, there will be one coming up in April, May, and I was just thinking maybe we could have that as one of the features like on it, and, you know, just for a presentation like that or building it into something else a bit bigger might be a good idea just because that will reach a, a really big network uh, across Canada. So. That, that might be an opportunity to kind of get to get it out. That you, Tom. <laughs> we'll discuss it. Anyone else? a question. Just um, thank you very much, Amy, and the organizers. Um, in terms of this particular guide, it sounds like you've done some consultation with municipalities around what they have in place. So has there been also, in turn, widespread dissemination of this guide now back to municipalities? Because I'm thinking it'd be certainly a role in health authorities with our, our health communities work to help with that. That would be really valuable to get like it and make it available, but I don't think we've done a big push with it. Well, we just, yeah, we, we let uh, health authorities know. Uh, and Yeah, but we can, I just think we can push it out a bit. Yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah. Yeah, especially municipalities. We work mainly through health authorities, exactly. but I think uh, we're always uh, sort of wonder about directly approaching municipalities. Although, it would probably be a good idea to approach, say, the Union of BC municipalities. Yeah. But for BCCDC to approach municipalities, really stepping in the place of the health authorities. So either we could do it with the health authority or go to UBCF, which has its own climate change adaptation committee. Yes. I think they'd be very good. We can do it both ways. Yeah. Yeah, and if somehow that could be tied into the smoke, because the heat and smoke is often a common issue here in the interior. And municipalities work on a annual budget we're already at the end of this fiscal and you know a lot of communities if, if anybody has any information on how to adapt for instance a curling rink or a hockey rink to both a, a, a cooling shelter and a smoke shelter uh, with the right MERV rating and kind of a checklist on whether or not your equipment can in fact handle those filters and this type of thing that would be very valuable. I mean, we put together with based on consultation with health authorities and literature review and stuff like that. But there's a lot of very practical things we have, but that authorities have done at different times. So it'd be great to be able to get that together. I guess, you know, even just for BC, I hate using the word community of practice, but just, just uh, if we had a way to bring together our own information and share it among ourselves because often stuff that happens in one area doesn't go beyond that area in BC as well. So maybe we need to find a way to do more of that and I think we, we should be doing more of that. Yeah. 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 Y
We're definitely, I mean, for smoke, we're... Smoke, we're pretty good, I think. But we're, we're, we're starting to get even better, I think, in that we've proposed to pull together and provincially brand a series of documents related to smoke and health so that they're accessible and consistent province-wide. And I, I think there's the opportunity to do that sort of thing in, in other areas as well. I think that also the use, uh, interior health in particular, has come up with, with stuff that nobody else yeah. So I think I think it'd be great to let everybody else know about that. But uh, what I'm saying is, you can go a step further and and adapt it so that it's relevant to the entire province. Yeah. And that, yeah. yeah. Well, we need to we do that because you have sort of there's islands of expertise. Of to describe the people who spent the time and the effort and done some really excellent work. Yeah, it'd be great to let other people know about it. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to know, of course, one of our challenges in the Interior Health Authority is we have 60 municipalities that we need to work with. When I hear about health taking on a coordinating role or leading roles, like, how do we do that? Doesn't that be open in Toronto? That doesn't necessarily work, right? So I'd like to know how Island Health does that or, you know, yeah, but I think sharing within pieces would be valuable. Yeah. Uh, if I may, just in terms of sharing, I think we we heard different ideas and, and have been thinking on different ideas. And, and I think one opportunity is if one community is developing a heat alert and response system or a plan, then perhaps involve community observer participant um, um, so that there's a mentor. And, and I'm thinking within BC and across the country, even as that's dialing in to the key meetings so that they can take the learnings from the process, um, to have kind of formal debriefs after those that involve people from other jurisdictions um, to create the network like, like the community of practice, um, maybe, maybe specific ones to specific kind of climate or, or the, uh, or recently, um, the, yeah, there's various. We're also thinking on open source, um, essentially like open source uh, materials, so that if Manitoba, for example, has developed some awesome materials, that with permission, so you could ask Manitoba, and it'd be a, uh, and I'm, I'm just picking on you, Manitoba, just to say you've got cool stuff, but. If you know that could be anyone offered to, to put almost an open source license so that you you in interior health could could take their material, change the graphics so it's more suitable to your area, or the, uh, and and then use those. So I think I think it would be neat to have these conversations about how we could best facilitate, um, and that's partly our role. Um, I mean, uh, if it's across provincial or territorial borders, then then that's something we can support. Um, so just to put out there, I think there's lots of different ways. Um, and so, uh, Cameron here, I, I just wanted to, in, in follow up of Greg's suggestion, I think it, it is a great idea and that's something that eventually national agencies and Health Canada and other uh, national bodies can coordinate and facilitate. Uh, it, it's very interesting to, to say that because uh, with this uh, 2017 uh, wildfire event in interior, what we did immediately at first stages when the wildfires <coughs> were an acute phase and ongoing, we contacted Alberta counterparts for their document development and inventory and archiving for the return to home instructions and health protection teams worked ahead of time with Alberta and they they generously shared <coughs> more experiences related to Fort McMurray experience and the issues they have uh, from disposing issues from inspection uh, piece from from fire retardant so a lot of knowledge and experience shared so we feel that it is an extremely valuable and area that a national body can coordinate of course. <coughs> I'll just say it's given me lots of ideas to explore. One, perhaps, would be to have 
rapid inventory of the key players and the events that they've experienced. So that should, say, your region be in a position experience that event, then you know that on X date in this time, these players experienced similar events, so you can call them up. But anyway, these are these are just um, initial ideas. But I will. Thanks very much for that. Right. And um, it's Melissa with uh, Environment Canada, and a part of I didn't have enough time to completely dictate or demonstrate everything that we are doing with Environment Canada. But one of the important factors that we've sort of brought into our system is an ability to be able to evaluate the services being able being provided, but also what our actual um, partners are doing at the provincial level and territorial level. And so with uh, Anna, you said, with Health Canada, we developed a survey that we were using in Ontario to evaluate what each of the individual public health units are doing based on each summer at the end of the summer for them to fill out. It's a, it's a questionnaire done in an Excel spreadsheet format. And then for this summer, we adapted it to be more nationally available because we have the new heat warnings right across the prairies. And we're asking at the end of the season to have each of the health authorities, municipal level, whichever level has been involved, fill out the form and inform us of who they're circulating messaging to, who's receiving it, what they're doing, what type of action they're doing so that we can share across each of the provinces and hopefully also be able to determine what we need to change in terms of service and how the message is getting out. Um, and also on the other side of that whole evaluation piece, we do do post-event surveys. Um, within our health and air quality program. Um, we usually only do two to four a year at the most, and they have to rel fall under the whole program. So it could be air quality, it could be cold, it could be heat. Um, but it is our hope that we get to do more heat post-event surveys. We did do one just last fall um, in the Southern Ontario area when we had a heat warning in fall, the very end of September last year. And uh, we're hoping that I would like, I don't want to see a large heat event in the interior, but I would like to see a post-event survey done in the interior to see what kind of updates we get on heat warnings and how people are changing, what they're doing during a heat event, for example, because that's one place we've never really seen that information out of. But I guess we can semi-hope for a heat event to do it, you know, so, yeah. So I, have, I, have, I have already made the bet that this summer in the interior is going to be on there uh, with my health protection staff, so. Okay, well then I'll be prepared. <laughs> How much do you have riding on that bed? Uh, is it either? So, so I have, our bets are one dollar. Okay. So. <laughs> Kevin said hi, he, you know, he fires. I think it's going to be a low fire summer too. Yeah. 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 And <laughs> we can also, be we have surveys set up to be a combination too. So air quality and heat issues at the same time. As we're almost at 5.30, I might just call it there, or at least let the people that are online off. Thanks again, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, me too. Well